Well, welcome everybody to October's uh, meeting of the Mornington Peninsula Astronomical Society, pre-recorded again uh, during the pandemic, uh, during uh, lockdown. On uh, the first slide, you'll uh, see uh, a picture of a, uh, a black hole, an artist's impression, uh, of course, and a uh, torus or ring of uh, dust that uh, surrounds it. And uh, this is part of a relatively new technique that uh, has been um, applied for working out the distances of uh, black holes uh, from Earth. This is uh, one of uh, the newer yardsticks uh, that are um, looking for echoes around uh, the black hole. Uh, you can't uh, observe the black hole uh, directly as such to work out its uh, distance from its uh, brightness. But uh, researchers at NASA's uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory have now used this uh, technique uh, to um, measure the uh, distances of over uh, 500 galaxies based upon the supermassive uh, black hole uh, found uh, at the centre of uh, each uh, galaxy. And around the black hole uh, sits uh, an accretion disk of matter that's uh, falling in and uh, orbiting around the black hole. Uh, due to uh, friction and other uh, processes, it gets uh, very, very hot, well over um, 10,000 10, degrees uh, Celsius or even more. And at that temperature, the atoms um, uh, dissociate, the electrons come off, and it turns into what's called a, a plasma. Now, that uh, swirling of uh, um, very, very hot uh, matter um, uh, actually uh, gives out bursts of uh, light occasionally. And uh, they are the key to this uh, technique um, uh, for uh, looking um, when those bursts of light uh, reflect off the uh, surrounding uh, dust cloud uh, that's uh, some way out. So the bursts are in the, um, the visible light, uh, whereas what actually bounces off the dust cloud is in uh, the uh, infrared light. So um, the, uh, the plasma, which is a gaseous form, uh, only actually condenses down uh, once it's uh, cold enough to uh, turn into uh, dust. And that temperature occurs at uh, about 1200 degrees Celsius, so not exactly cold, but relative to the, uh, the tens of thousands of degrees uh, of the uh, infalling uh, plasma around uh, the black hole, uh, it is uh, quite cool. And uh, so consequently, um, what, uh, what you know from this is that uh, depending on where the dust cloud is, uh, you know the start of the dust cloud, uh, the temperature is um, 1200 degrees uh, Celsius. Uh, whereas uh, as you get closer into the black hole, the energy being uh, given off by this uh, really hot uh, plasma um, causes um, uh, atoms not to clump together because it's uh, too hot for them and uh, that doesn't give out uh, any light at all. So in other words, it doesn't um, reflect the light uh, that, uh, that is coming until uh, you get out to uh, where the dust uh, cools. So the idea is actually to wait for one of these uh, outbursts of, of visible light to occur next to the black hole, um, record the date, and then uh, wait for that light to be reflected sometimes months or even years later. Um, by the time it uh, gets out to the uh, the outer uh, dusk, uh, dust ring uh, well out uh, from uh, the black hole. And then you record that second date. And using the speed of light, you can uh, work out the difference uh, between those two dates to actually give an accurate measurement of the distance from um, the accretion disk around the black hole to that um, ring of uh, cold, colder uh, dust. Now, the more energy that's actually given out by the uh, central plasma disk, the further uh, away will be pushed uh, the ring. So um, it, uh, it may need to be further out uh, from the black hole to reach uh, 1200 degrees if it's a particularly energetic um, uh, accretion disk uh, in, uh, in the middle. So measuring the distance between the hot uh, central disk and the ring reveals the actual energy output of the disk that is uh, pushing away the uh, dust in all effect. So the immediate energy is directly proportional to its uh, true brightness and you can measure with a telescope how bright the disk appears to be and because uh, brightness uh, reduces by an inverse square law, so in other words double the distance you um, quarter the brightness, treble the distance you one ninth uh, the brightness, this allows you to actually calculate how far away uh, the Earth is and uh, this um, this technique is a, is a promising um, alternative uh, method to other so-called standard candle methods uh, of working out uh, distances, uh, particularly where we uh, are able to actually pick up these uh, bursts of light um, coming from um, uh, 
uh, around uh, black holes in uh, neighbouring galaxies. Now, moving uh, moving on to uh, to, to tonight. Um, welcome, uh, certainly uh, any new members uh, to the society, and this is certainly a very unusual time. Still uh, continuing, and hope, hopefully it's going to be restricted enough that we can get back to uh, member meetings of uh, one sort of an, or another um, before uh, Christmas or before the end of the year. Uh, normally, the final meeting of this nature uh, for the society each year is in November, so there usually isn't a December. Uh, general meeting of um, of the society. Um, however, there is normally um, a Christmas barbecue uh, to be held uh, at the Briars, and uh, assuming that we're allowed to under whatever um, lockdown restrictions are in place um, just before Christmas, we will uh, certainly um, have uh, some some form of barbecue uh, this year, even if it's uh, for a uh, a smaller number of uh, members uh, at uh, at the one time. Um, uh, next, I'll look at um, the events of uh, the uh, past and coming months. And obviously, due to the lockdown, we've not been able to do our usual large number of um, schools and uh, scout and guide nights and uh, other community groups. Um, then the uh, main talk and uh, Q&A session will be from uh, an excellent lecture given by a, a Sydney University professor of uh, astrophysics, uh, Professor uh, Geraint uh, Lewis. And uh, this one is all about uh, the uh, future history of the universe, and he actually paraphrases it by uh, referring to it as uh, the end of time. Um, uh, certainly everybody uh, will learn uh, something out of this um, particular talk, as it really goes uh, deep into uh, the future, and indeed in into um, uh, predictions of uh, how new universes can come out uh, towards uh, even the end of uh, our um, overall uh, universe. Following that will be uh, Sky for the Month by uh, Mark uh, Stevens, who has also uh, kindly sent that in uh, pre-recorded, and um, a segment by uh, Sky Murphy on uh, creating a universe at uh, the uh, other end of uh, the scale to um, the uh, the future history of the universe at, uh, at the end of the scale, uh, and then a number of um, uh, interesting uh, science clips. One uh, all about uh, the uh, zodiacal light. Uh, given by um, uh, one of the uh, uh, podcasts by uh, the European Southern uh, Observatory, and uh, that, and that's very interesting, particularly if you've never noticed the zodiacal light um, of a, a night time or, or early morning in the, in the sky yourself. Um, uh, providing, of course, it's dark enough where you are to uh, see um, see this uh, reflection of light from uh, the plane of the solar system. Following that, um, the uh, the History Guy will uh, talk a bit about uh, Lord Byron's daughter and the first uh, computer program. So uh, adding a bit of history into uh, the, uh, the agenda today. Then uh, Toby Handy uh, will talk about um, Isaac Newton's uh, quarantine period in uh, 1665 and 1666, which of course is the time when there was the uh, massive uh, pandemic of uh, the Black, uh, Black Death, the uh, plague, the bubonic plague. Uh, throughout uh, Europe and caused uh, incredibly high uh, death rate um, in the population there. And um, she actually takes us through some of the uh, notes that are available online of um, Newton's original uh, manuscript and uh, talks about what today we know as uh, integration and um, differentiation and uh, takes you through uh, some examples of uh, the original notes there. And uh, they are actually quite hard to read uh, compared to what we're used to uh, reading these days. And uh, finally, uh, we have um, Derek Muller of uh, the Veritasium channel uh, talking about uh, dust. And uh, is it uh, mostly uh, skin cells? He um, sort of looks at the, the urban myth of that and uh, whether there's uh, uh, any uh, grain of truth uh, to it. This dust, of course, is not uh, the interstellar dust. This, of course, is uh, dust that uh, will be uh, familiar in uh, everybody's homes, no matter how clean uh, you uh, you like to try and make them. And at the end, we'll have a, um, a close by uh, our member uh, Paula Miles again, this time um, sharing with us uh, uh, Classical Gas, which is the Mason Williams uh, absolute classic uh, guitar. Um, um, piece from uh, about 1969. Um, I believe uh, originally it was meant to be called Classical Gasoline, but uh, there was some uh, mix-up in the promotion of it, and they refer to it as Classical Gas, and of course gas had 
had a more um, hippie-ish meaning in uh, the 1960s, so uh, it seemed to uh, fit in uh, very, very well. And uh, Paula, uh, Paula has um, done that on her um, uh, guitar, which, uh, let me see, what, uh, what was the make of that guitar? Um, it was an American Ovation uh, guitar that uh, she's used uh, in her piece. And those who are familiar with the Australian movie called uh, The Dish, uh, which was uh, set around 1969 at the time of the moon landings and um, and featured the Parkes radio telescope, also featured highly uh, this uh, this piece as well, um, as uh, as performed by Mason Williams uh, himself. So looking at uh, the recent events of the society, obviously uh, all our outreach. Uh, um, interaction with the, with the general public and schools uh, is still on hold and uh, will be for the remainder of uh, this year. On the 23rd of September, a committee had a, a virtual meeting online via Zoom again and um, as uh, usual members were invited to, to attend and listen if, uh, if they wished. Uh, the key things mainly covered by this particular session um, that were new was um, uh, an in-depth look at what um, annual merchandise uh, we need to um, order and uh, for example with those um, infrequently we um, we get um, merchandise with the MPAS logo on it so for example t-shirts, polo shirts, jackets, um, pens and other things like that and uh, that was looked at to, as to what should be ordered and also of course uh, determining how many of the excellent uh, Quasar Astronomy 2021 almanacs uh, we will be uh, ordering. Um, there were also changes uh, discussed uh, in the tri booking system to handle um, new members coming in and of course old members who decide at a later date to uh, rejoin after um, a, a period of uh, lapsed memberships. So there's a new mechanism involved now uh, in tri bookings uh, for that. On the 3rd of October, which was a Saturday, we had uh, an online social gathering at, uh, on, on Zoom again. And uh, by all accounts, I believe that went uh, very well with uh, probably a dozen or so uh, members uh, attending that. Uh, I came in uh, quite late uh, that particular evening. And um, as of uh, certainly as of today, the, uh, the Briars uh, access still remains uh, off for, uh, for the society. Um, those who live within five kilometres are allowed to actually walk to the briars and uh, exercise around the parks, uh, but um, the, the picnic areas and um, any of the uh, lessees on the site uh, are obviously uh, out of bounds still. And at this stage, um, because it's not date based, it's uh, based on number of uh, active uh, cases of uh, community transmission. Um, we're still unclear yet as to when we're going to have uh, access, but as soon as we find out, um, we'll be letting uh, the membership know, obviously. Now, coming up uh, in the uh, the coming months, so uh, the first thing is to remind um, everyone that uh, members may order some of this uh, special uh, merchandise, but it has to be done before the 25th of October, otherwise you'll miss the annual uh, order for this year. Uh, this is things such as um, uh, t-shirts and uh, polo shirts and jackets and that uh, for uh, the society and name tags as well if you wish a uh, special uh, metal name tag uh, for yourself that's also included as part of the merchandise and shown in the slides here in yellow is uh, the link to go to to actually buy online that uh, before in terms of uh, receiving it that will be uh, that will be done face to face as best we can and failing that by um, by mail order if uh, necessary. So the intention is to try and get um, get it out by the November meeting, assuming that we're able to have some sort of uh, get together uh, in November. Uh, but if that doesn't work, then uh, we'll um, start with, uh, with the delivery option as well. Now the next committee meeting is 28th of uh, October at a slightly earlier time of 7.30pm. Uh, uh, and uh, again, any member is uh, welcome to uh, listen in. Bear in mind, it's not uh, astronomy content as such. It's more um, the management of the society and uh, what's actually going on um, within, uh, within the uh, halls of power. 7th of November is our next uh, online social gathering and all members are welcome to uh, attend uh, that. The link will be posted out on eScorpius and on the members' uh, Facebook page uh, as well. 
the next general meeting at this stage is anticipated to be pre-recorded um, for the 18th of November and will appear on the YouTube channel um, as usual. If you haven't yet subscribed to the YouTube channel, it's free. There's no cost involved at all. And um, that will mean that uh, you would get notified when new videos are posted up there um, rather than relying on having to uh, go to eScorpius to uh, see a, a notification by email. Uh, at this stage, the geology expedition, um, which uh, probably is uh, involving a bit of um, uh, dinosaur fossil hunting as well at uh, Point Leo uh, foreshore, um, has a big question mark over it for the 21st of November, unless pandemic restrictions are eased very significantly, given that we were anticipating about 50 members probably uh, uh, coming along to that. Um, my prediction on the postcard would uh, my prediction on the back of the postcard would be that it's likely to be uh, postponed until uh, uh, next year sometime. Um, but a question mark at the moment, but probably not until next year. Nineteenth of December at this stage is uh, what was shown on the calendar very early in the year um, for the Christmas barbecue, and whether or not that proves feasible will depend on what the uh, the pandemic. Uh, restrictions are that are in place uh, closer to uh, that particular date. Now one other thing that um, uh, is uh, of, of interest as well to, to note is that um, uh, a new astronomy society started up uh, last month it, uh, based at Phillip Island and it's the Island Astronomy Association Incorporated uh, and it um, is uh, looking for members uh, certainly around uh, the Phillip Island and uh, Bass Coast uh, area that uh, it will try and service with uh, for, for the general public and uh, possibly schools as well. And uh, at the moment, I believe it has uh, 20 members already signed up, so it's uh, done excellently uh, to uh, to get going from uh, word go. Another thing to announce is that uh, the next uh, Vastrock Victorian Astronomy Convention is um, has been announced for Ballarat in 2021. It'll be on the weekend of Saturday, Sunday, 2nd and 3rd of October. So you may wish to put those uh, into your diaries now. Um, it will definitely have a Zoom component just in case there are any lockdown restrictions in place. And I believe they're going to have that whether or not there are uh, lockdowns which means that you might be able to participate even if you can't get there for uh, other reasons. At th this stage, there's a call for presentations and uh, posters um, from any interested uh, member. And um, the, uh, the form for that was sent around on uh, eScorpius um, uh, a few days ago. Um, if anyone is interested as well, they can, uh, and they didn't receive that email, by all means send a, an email to the society or ask on the Facebook page and we'll, uh, we'll send you out uh, more details on that. This is being hosted by the Ballarat uh, Astronomical Society as well. And uh, they're very experienced in uh, running Vastrox and uh, even the national one, NASA. Um, <clears throat> the uh, Nobel Prizes in the science areas have uh, been uh, announced uh, fairly recently. Um, if you uh, remember, the Nobel Prizes are named after uh, Alfred Nobel, the, inv the inventor of uh, dynamite. And uh, he actually left almost all of his um, massive estate in his will uh, to actually set these prices up uh, in perpetuity. And, um, and uh, they're, they're designed um, for those during the pre preceding year who have conferred the greatest benefit to mankind. So they're never actually awarded posthumously. So you have to be alive to uh, receive uh, the award and um, they usually require a number of years to actually confirm that a discovery has uh, has had uh, a very um, groundbreaking uh, significance uh, worldwide. Now it's interesting that uh, Alfred Nobel's uh, family was actually um, uh, hotly contesting at the time uh, the will. They didn't want the idea of his uh, huge fortune going outside the family and they fought it for about five years but eventually gave up before the first uh, prize was then able to be uh, awarded. So uh, it was quite controversial. And obviously he uh, felt his family could get on quite well without the, uh, the proceeds of his uh, estate. Now of uh, the particular Nobel Prizes this year, the uh, one closest to astronomy was the uh, physics one. And there were three uh, laureates uh, named for that, for their discoveries about uh, black holes. 
50% of the prize money um, has gone to uh, Roger Penrose for the discovery that black hole formation is a, um, a prediction of the general theory of uh, relativity. And the remaining 50% uh, is shared between Reinhard Genzel and Andrea Ghez for the um, discovery of a um, supermassive uh, compact object at the centre of uh, our galaxy, so the one at the centre of uh, the Milky Way. The Chemistry Nobel Prize um, went to uh, Emmanuel Charpentier and Jennifer Doudna for the uh, development of a method of uh, genome editing and uh, they discovered the so-called uh, CRISPR genetic scissors uh, back in uh, 2012 so it's taken a, a few years to um, uh, get uh, the recognition they deserve for that and uh, it means that researchers these days can uh, change the DNA of uh, animals, plants and microorganisms with extremely high precision and has uh, had a revolutionary impact on the life sciences, is contributing to new cancer therapies and indeed uh, the citation says it may lead to uh, the dream of uh, curing inherited diseases as well coming true. Now, given that, with, uh, with the Nobel Prizes, we'll uh, move on to uh, the talk for this evening. Now, the talk uh, for uh, this evening is uh, being given by um, a, a Sydney University uh, lecturer, Professor uh, Geraint uh, Lewis. He uh, gave a public lecture um, at uh, the Royal Institution uh, in uh, Albemarle Street uh, in London and uh, a very uh, interesting talk uh, indeed and uh, I'm sure uh, you'll learn lots uh, from it and indeed uh, I've certainly learned uh, some things uh, from uh, listening to it as well it's uh, a very very um, good uh, explanation it's then followed by a, a, a Q&A session that uh, goes for about uh, half an hour uh, afterwards and this is all about the, uh, the future history of uh, the universe so uh, enjoy <laughs> Thank you. Um, so it's great to be back at the RA again. I spoke here last year, and it's such a fantastic auditorium. Uh, that's, I'm a professor of astrophysics at the University of Sydney, and uh, as was mentioned there, I'm, I'm, I'm a cosmologist, right? My job is to try and understand the forces that have shaped the evolution of the universe, from a time when the, when the universe was basically formless to the rich structure in the universe that we see around us today. So what I want to do tonight is basically take us all on a bit of a journey. What we want to do is not take a journey through space, but a journey through time. And we want to look backwards first to see how our universe evolved from its birth in the Big Bang to the universe with stars and planets and galaxies today. And then we want to turn around and run the universe forward and ask what fate holds for the universe. Just what is going to happen as this universe gets older and older. So, Every journey starts with a single step, and before we take a step backwards into the past or a step forwards into the future, I think it's important to understand where we are, where we are today, just what kind of universe do we live in. And of course, the starting point for that is where are we now? And we find ourselves on the surface of a small rocky planet. And it's a very special planet. It's an extraordinary planet because out of the thousands of planets we know that we've discovered in the universe and the trillions of planets we think are out there in the observable universe, this is the only one where we have complete and utter evidence that there is life on this planet. Sometimes it's a bit difficult to see intelligent life on this planet, but there is life on this planet. Okay? Now, I'm going to touch upon life in the universe as we go out into the future a little bit. So it's important to try and understand what we mean when we say life. And it turns out that defining life is incredibly difficult. When you get down to you know, the details, how you define whether what's alive and what's dead, um, people set up rules and say, right, this is my dividing line, this is the living stuff, that's the dead stuff, or this stuff on the dead side which just looks a bit alive. And that happens all the time. And there are arguments about whether viruses are alive, whether prions are alive, these things even smaller than viruses. And so defining life, that would take another lecture and probably a few more lectures, and we would be here until uh, almost the end of the universe trying to define what life is. But what I'm going to touch upon is an aspect of life which, um, in my opinion, I think is one of the key things that life does if we're going to define something as a living organism. And that's to do with energy, okay? All life processes energy. 
So what we have in this picture here, we have a lovely sunflower. That sunflower has captured sunlight, and that sunlight has been stored as energy in the chemical bonds inside the plant. Creatures come along, and they eat the plant, and they can use that energy to run their own chemical processes in their body. And similarly, we could eat the plants, or we could eat the animals that ate the plants, and so there's a, just a continuous progression whereby we use and process energy, and that is one of the de defining characteristics of life. All life processes energy of some sort. And that energy not only drives the chemical reactions in your body, but it also drives the sort of mental reactions in your mind when you think, right? We all know that, you know, when you have a sugar low, it's very hard to think about anything. You need energy to run your brain. In fact, it uses up a very large amount of the, uh, the energy that you take in. So there's actually a very strong link between flows of energy and processing of information. And any time you run your computer and your computer's doing very um, difficult calculations or updating Facebook or something, it's processing information. And you can feel the heat that's generated by that information being processed. So if any living creature is going to be sentient and know about its environment and react to that, it's going to need to have an energy flow to drive that sort of behavior. Now, the ultimate source of energy on the Earth of course, is the sun. In the middle of the sun, every second, 11 million tons of hydrogen get turned into helium. That releases energy, which takes 100,000 years to per percolate through the sun, and then eight minutes to get from the surface of the sun to the earth, where it's absorbed by this sunflower, or it lands on the pavement outside in London and makes the place even hotter. Right? So all life on earth exists because we have a vast reservoir of energy right next door to us in the universe, and we can use that energy, and that has driven life and evolution uh, up until the present day. Take away that source of energy, you have no life. What we'll be seeing is that energy will come to play a critical role in what life can do when we look at the far future of the universe. It becomes the scarce resource. It's the thing that any life that exists in the distant future universe is going to need to seek if it's going to continue to live. But let's just try and remember our place in the universe. As I said, we're on the surface of this rocky planet. Our energy is given to us by the sun, which is a very typical dwarf star. And our sun is not alone in the universe, but the sun actually occupies a small patch of the universe with roughly 300 billion other suns in an object which is known as the Milky Way. When we look out into the universe, we see that there are possibly 100 billion to a trillion other galaxies out there. So there's a huge number of stars, huge number of galaxies, huge number of potential places where there could be life. But we have no idea what the frequency of life is in the universe. Life could be very common, or life could be extremely rare. And all of our observational evidence is quite consistent with this being the only place in the universe where there is life at the moment. So I said, this is a special planet. So before we play the game of looking into the future, let's work out how we understand what happened in the past. Okay? And what we know is that people have looked at the skies for thousands of years, and you see patterns of stars on the sky. And people have generally invented stories of heroes and gods and legends to explain the various patterns that we see. For us here at the RI, of course, the important thing is not just the stories that people told, but how they came to apply science to understanding the evolution of the universe. And this all happened, of course, during the time of the, the birth of modern science. And I'll just pop up this guy here. This, of course, is probably Britain's most famous scientist, second famous if you uh, consider Stephen Hawking as well. But this, this is Isaac Newton, who in my mind should be Britain's most famous scientist. Isaac Newton was around at the time when there was a, a, just a changing viewpoint on how we understand the universe. And I like this picture. This picture was taken off the back of the old pound note. There's people in this room who clearly have never seen an old pound note if you're too young. But in the old days, there used to be a pound note. On the back of it was this picture of Isaac Newton. And I like this picture because there's a picture of Isaac Newton with this telescope. And he observed the universe. He used this telescope to see what was going on. Now, he was not the first 
to look at the heavens. It's reported that Galileo was the first to look at the heavens and see, when he looked at the planet Jupiter, that Jupiter had companions, that there were moons orbiting Jupiter. And that led to this general idea that there must be some sort of order to the heavens, and then people wondering whether the order in the heavens is similar to the order down here on Earth, and if I understand how things behave here on Earth, maybe that will tell me how things are behaving in the heavens. And so what you start to do is you, you start to dispel the need for gods and heroes in describing what's going on in the universe, but what you want are laws of science that tell you how things behave. Now, the other reason that I like this picture that in uh, Newton's lap there is, is his book, The Principia, where essentially he laid down the, the key ideas which became classical mechanics, how things react to forces. But also in there he described the law of gravity. And the picture that we have in the background there is sort of Newton's description of how gravity works in basically holding the Earth in its orbit as it travels around the sun. And of course, Newton's great insight was to realize that the force that takes an apple and pulls it from the tree and pulls it to the ground is exactly the same force that holds the moon in its orbit around the Earth, the Earth in its orbit around the sun, and Jupiter's moons in their orbit around Jupiter. So you could write down mathematical equations and you could make predictions. You could predict where Jupiter's moons are going to be because they are just obeying the laws of science. Right? No need to introduce any gods or mythical beings anywhere because it's all there in the equations. Now, some people don't like that. That leads to a very sterile universe, of course, where everything is just governed by mathematical equations, but it at least means it's predictable. Right? We know where things are going to be. Now, in the 400 years or so since we had Newton, the only thing that's changed is that we've gotten deeper into our physical laws. We understand the physical laws that govern the universe in a lot more detail. And we've peered more deeply into the universe. And what we've done is developed new telescopes can see further and further out into the distant cosmos. And this picture here, this is a telescope that's currently being constructed in the Southern Hemisphere. This is the Square Kilometer Array, which has been built in South Africa and Australia. It will be a radio telescope, so it can only see radio waves, and it will basically be a collecting area of one square kilometer. So it will be able to see some of the faintest things that are out there in the universe. But as well as uh, square kilometer array, we have lots of giant optical telescopes. We have telescopes in space that look at, look at X-rays and gamma rays and look at microwaves, etc. And what they've revealed is a universe which is, my humble opinion, being a cosmologist, quite exciting. Okay? So what we've got here, we have a picture that was um, made by the WMAP consortium. WMAP is just a telescope that's in space, the Wilkinson an uh, Microwave Anisotropy Probe. Its job was to look more deeply into the universe than any other telescopes. But what we've got here is a picture of our entire universe as we understand it, okay? both in terms of what we can see and in terms of what we can understand in terms of the physics that's going on in the universe. Now, because light travels at a finite speed, when you look at more and more distant objects, you're looking further and further back in time. And what we have is a, a picture of our universe from today, as far back as we can see, and what we can see is that the universe has changed and evolved over its lifetime. The first important thing is to realize that our universe hasn't been around forever. The universe appears to have been born in an event now known as the Big Bang that occurred roughly 14 billion years ago. So our universe has a finite age. But looking back, we see that the universe in the past was different to the universe today. So today around us, we see all these stars and galaxies. And as we look back in the past, we also see stars and galaxies, but they're different to the ones today. They're less formed. And as we push back further and further, we get to a point where there were no galaxies at all. And we can push back even further, and we run into the, the very start of the universe. So in terms of the universe's evolution, you can go from left to right. At this side, you have the Big Bang. The universe was filled with material, all smoothly distributed. Then the laws of physics acted over roughly 14 billion years 
to give us the universe that we see today. And so there are a number of key features that uh, people like to talk about. The very birth itself, which is something that we do not understand. We do not have, yet have the laws of physics to understand the very birth of the universe. But after that, the evolution of the universe through this rapid expansion known as inflation, through the overall evolution of matter into stars and galaxies, that all seems to be described very accurately by the laws of physics. So in fact, one of the things that we like to do, it's actually a very big part of modern astrophysics, is we like to build our own universes. Okay, and I have PhD students working for me that, you know, they generate universes before breakfast. Well, generally not, because none of them are ever up before breakfast, right? So early afternoon, they'll generate a universe. So what do I mean by that? What do I mean by generate a universe? Well, as I said, we think all of the processes underway in the universe are just governed by the laws of science. So if I take my laws of science, my laws of physics, my law of how gravity works, how gases work, how nuclear physics works, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and I translate those equations into computer code, and I give the equations to a computer and say to the computer, solve the equations for me because that's what good computers are good at, I can actually generate a synthetic universe. And so in the next sort of animation, I'm going to show you the results of uh, one of the big simulations of the universe that was done uh, by a group called Illustrious. Essentially, what you do is you just say, I'm going to take a big volume of the universe. This volume is billions of light years across, much bigger than our own galaxy. I'm going to put matter in there, nice and smoothly distributed like it was after the Big Bang. And then I'm going to hit go, and you can solve all of the, the difficult equations, and you can tell me what the universe looks like. So one of the best things about giving astronomy talks, you can just put on the movies, and you can nip out, have a cup of coffee, come back when the movie ends, and just say, wasn't that lovely, right? So what we're seeing here, this is matter moving in the early universe. So it was originally smoothly distributed. Gravity started acting and pulling matter together. And the matter just doesn't fall into one big lump, but it falls into several lumps connected by this structure which is known as the cosmic web. Inside these lumps, gas can pool together, and when that gas pools, it can form stars. So where you get these big lumps, that's where you form your galaxies. So inside these galaxies, we have stars burning away, but stars evolve over time. And eventually, the giant stars, they basically run out of fuel, and then they explode. And hopefully, we should have an explosion any time now. There we are, right on cue. Okay? What you've got there is a giant star that has been burning elements in its core, hydrogen to helium, helium into carbon, carbon into oxygen, da 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 da. All those elements are caught up in the, the heart of the star. But for life, having those elements in the heart of a star is pretty pointless. What you need them is spread out through the rest of the intergalactic medium, or interstellar medium, I should say. And for that material to be recycled into the next generation of stars. So that's what happens when massive stars explode. These stars explode and they spit out the heavy elements that are needed for life. So it's kind of sobering to think about this that, you know, you look at yourself and you think, right, yeah, this is me. I am 90 years old, right? But I'm made of water, right? Mostly water. The hydrogen in that water, that hydrogen was formed in the Big Bang. That hydrogen is 14 billion years old. The oxygen in the water, that oxygen was formed in the heart of a big star. And in fact, the elements that make up me have probably been through the hearts of several stars, through several generations of being formed, material spat out, recycled, being spat out, and being recycled. And the one that I always like to mention is that elements like this, I was told by the jeweler it's gold, okay, might be, but gold. Stars don't create gold when stars burn. Gold is only created when stars die. That's, that gives you the conditions that can squeeze atoms together so hard to give you gold. So I said, if you want to be romantic, then you should say that a star had to die to give us this ring, right? But we're implicitly tied to that evolution of stars. There's no way we could have had life in the early universe with just hydrogen and helium. There's just not the complexity there to have life. So what we have got, of course, is we've got our picture of today. Right, this is today. This is a lovely picture taken in Chile. This is the VLT, the Very Large Telescope. We're not very imaginative in naming telescopes. The ELT has come in. 
extremely large telescope. I kid you not. There's also OWL, which is overwhelmingly large telescope. <laughs> we should spend more time on thinking of these names. But anyway, the VLT exists. It's in Chile. It's four eight-meter telescopes. All the good telescopes in the world are now in Chile because they've got some of the clearest skies. You can get up very high. And this is a beautiful view of the center of our own Milky Way galaxy. Okay, So if you're in Chile, your eyes do not see it quite as good as this, but the view is quite spectacular. But we find ourselves on a rocky planet orbiting a fairly typical smallish star in a reasonably big galaxy, which is one of many hundreds of billions or trillions of other galaxies in the universe. Now, one of the issues about when you think about evolution, right? let's go back to the evolution of, of humans, is that we often make the mistake is that here we are, here we are now, and therefore we are the pinnacle of evolution. This must be the end point. How can it get better than this? Right? But of course we're wrong. Humans are still evolving, still changing all the time. Evolution hasn't stopped because we've suddenly discovered the iPhone. Right? We are still evolving. And there are different pressures on how things evolve, but we are still evolving. And it's the same with the universe. You might think, well, this planet is quite comfortable, and this universe looks kind of pretty and photogenic. Maybe this is the pinnacle of the universe. This is the way that it's always going to be from now on. How can it get any better? Unfortunately, this is not the pinnacle of the universe. And at some level, this is the start of a long decline. So on that happy note, let's now turn the picture around and start looking at the future. Now, in understanding the future history of the universe, we have some limitations that we're going to have to acknowledge. Studying the universe's evolution from the Big Bang to now, you can have a telescope and you can see what's happened in the universe to guide you in what processes were important. But unfortunately, we don't have any telescopes that can receive light from the future. It would be beautiful to see what the future universe is going to do because that would help you make a prediction because you can see it, right? So we don't. So we, we, at some level, we're working in the dark, right? We're going to make predictions and there will be some level of uncertainty because we don't know everything about our current state of the universe perfectly. But there's a bigger problem, and the bigger problem is, is that we don't know our laws of physics perfectly. We know that we have some very good laws of physics. We have quantum mechanics. You know, if your iPhone wants to work, it relies on quantum mechanics. We know that to a very high degree of accuracy. We also have a really good description of gravity given to us by Einstein. Again, GPS works. It gets you down to you know, a centimeter on the surface of the Earth. You need to worry about Einstein's theory of gravity to make GPS work. The only problem that we have is that when we have conditions where we have to worry about quantum mechanics and gravity together, they just do not fit together mathematically. So there will be places where we go into the future that this uncertainty of how these sort of mesh together are going to cause problems. So as we go out into the far future universe, we're going to get a bit more speculative. And I'll try and you know, flash a speculation meter as we go. But nearby times, pretty good. Distant times, things are going to get a little more ropey. So what's the first thing that's going to happen? So what we're going to do is we're going to go forward, and we'll go forward in steps, but the steps will get bigger because uh, the universe will have different epochs where things are important, and they tend to be spaced out at larger and larger steps. All we're going to worry about at the moment are the next few billion years. right? So as was mentioned, Brexit might be solved on that time scale, or it might not. But what's going to happen? Well, the first thing that we need to think about is essentially the end of our Milky Way galaxy. Now, again, look at that lovely picture. In a few billion years, it will be gone. So what do I mean? Well, here's our Milky Way galaxy. It's a spiral galaxy. There's a bulge in the middle, stars going around the outside. Our sun is one of those stars going around the outside. The sun takes 250 million years to do one orbit around the center of the Milky Way. The problem is the Milky Way is not alone in the universe. It inhabits this patch of the universe with two other big galaxies. One of them is called M33, or Triangulum. It's a tenth the mass of the Milky Way. We don't care. The other one, M31, is Andromeda, which is about the same size as the Milky Way. And Andromeda is approaching us at half a million kilometers per hour, which if you do the maths quickly, which says in about four billion years, it will be here. 
So what's going to happen is that Andromeda and the Milky Way are going to collide. Okay? So you saw there there was the initial collision. Stars started to get ripped off. So gravity pulls the stars, starts to fling them outwards. Now, the sun might be one of those stars that ends up being thrown out of the Milky Way galaxy. So the collision has just started. Now, before I proceed, I should point out, I've got a little time scale up there, and I've tried to use words to describe the, the time. So a billion years, that makes sense. We all know what a billion is. We all know what the national debt is, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So we can understand trillions. But we're going to have to go to bigger numbers. So there's scientific notation, 5 times 10 to the 9 years. All that means is 5 followed by 9 zeros. That's 5 billion. Okay, so you will see numbers to the power of something, just add that many zeros on to the end and just say, wow, that's a lot of time, okay? So, we had this initial collision. So if you saw in that collision, the two galaxies approached each other, some stars got thrown off, but then they separated. So it's gonna get kind of exciting. Why? Because in the collision, the Milky Way galaxy gets shaken. Okay? It gets vigorously shaken by the uh, Andromeda galaxy coming close. And what that shaking does is it causes gas clouds inside the Milky Way to collapse. Now, that gas is the stuff that gives you lots of stars. But if you shake it and make it all collapse at the same time, then what happens is you produce lots of very massive stars, very giant stars. So massive stars are uh, hot, they glow blue, and so for a little while our universe... Our local patch of the universe is going to look like a Christmas tree. Our sky will be completely filled with these hot blue stars glowing away. But the collision isn't over, right? Gravity started doing its thing. Galaxies will come back together, and they will smack each other again. And notice that as they smack, they get closer and closer. They're losing energy because stars are being thrown out, but they are now merging together. The other thing that happens is that some of that gas, instead of getting turned into stars, swirls down into the center of the resultant galaxy that's formed from the Milky Way merging with Andromeda. I'm going to have to apologize in advance. This object is known as Milkometa. I hate the name of the passion. I have to use it. Sorry, it's part of my union card, I think. So there's going to be a big black hole in the center of this remnant galaxy. Gas is going to go and fall in towards that black hole, and that gas, as it falls in, starts to swirl around and crash into other bits of gas and get very hot. So the center of this Milkometa galaxy will start to glow. It will glow very, very brightly. Okay? So we will not only have this Christmas tree of bright blue stars across the sky, we will also have this very active region around the black hole glowing brightly and shooting out matter. Here you can see there's a big jet of matter coming out. So that's all very exciting. So that would be nice to see. I'd like to hang around for a few billion years to see this collision. But there's a problem. And the problem is, is that it's all going to be over way too quickly. What do I mean by that? Well. The, uh, the massive stars that we have in the Milky Way, um, they, are, they are James Dean stars. Some people know who James Dean was. Live fast, die young. Amy Whitehouse. Other than that, my cultural references are out the window, I'm afraid. So giant stars live fast, die young. So they burn for 10 million years, and then bang, they're gone. So that Christmas tree effect will go away. Similarly, that gas which is swishing around in the middle, well, that eventually gets eaten up by the black hole. So the active galaxy, the part which glows really brightly, that goes away. And what we're left with is the rest of the crash is really boring. The two beautiful spiral galaxies, Andromeda and the Milky Way, which were there at the start, are now completely gone. We are left with this amorphous blob with a rather horrible name. Okay? So, that's kind of sad, right? One of the nice things about being an astronomer is looking up at the sky and seeing the structure of the Milky Way. In this future uh, uh, galaxy after the collision, either we will be inside and we'll just have a uniform spread of stars all over the sky, or we'll be outside, having been spat out, and be looking back at an amorphous blob. But there's more things to worry about, right? So now we've moved on, we're now getting to roughly seven billion years into the future. 
As I mentioned, these galaxies collide, but one thing is kind of interesting is that stars are actually very small compared to the separation between them. So you're going to take 200 billion stars, 200 billion stars, smash them together, and not one star will collide with another star. Okay? So our sun will survive the collision, right? The sun will sail past all the other stars. I said it might end up somewhere interesting, and it might end up somewhere not so interesting. But we're now seven, getting towards seven billion years into the future. The problem, the problem is, is that the sun is currently five billion years old. It was formed five billion years ago. And what I mean by the sun is five billion years, I mean for five billion years, the sun has been turning hydrogen into helium at the core of the sun. And we know how much hydrogen there is in the sun. And so we can estimate how long the sun has got until it exhausts all of its hydrogen. And it's roughly five to six billion years. So while the sun might uh, survive this collision, it's going to run out of its hydrogen fuel. Now that's, I've said, the death of the sun. It's not quite the death. The sun doesn't die nice and quietly. When the sun runs out of hydrogen, it sort of rearranges its internal pieces and tries to start burning helium into heavier elements rather than hydrogen. That causes the sun to swell. It swells and cools. So it goes from being a typical yellow star into being a red giant but it continues to swell and swell and swell. It eats Mercury, it eats Venus, it gets brighter and brighter, and by this point, the energy flow from the sun strips the atmosphere off the Earth, boils away the ocean, and completely sterilizes the surface. Right? This is reasonably unavoidable. Okay? This, this is what's going to happen when the sun runs out of hydrogen. So, eventually, we're not quite sure how big the sun is going to get. There are some that think that the sun is actually going to get larger than the orbit of the Earth and completely swallow the Earth, so the Earth will be completely and utterly obliterated, and the sun might even swell out to towards the orbit of Mars. After that point, the sun then goes through uh, a rather sort of um, middle-age crisis, whereby it sort of shrinks and grows and shrinks and... We all know what happens to get to middle age, right? Shrinks and growth. Uh, but and then eventually the sun becomes unstable and it blows off its outer layers and the sun is gone. Now, if this is the only planet in the universe where there is life and we haven't gotten off the surface by then, then that's the end of life in the universe. Right? The Earth will not survive. Now, it's, there's seven billion years to go, so we sort of hope on that time scale that we can you know, put our differences between us and work together and think maybe it would be a good idea to get off the planet before the sun completely evaporates it. Right? It may take a few billion years of arguing to get to that point, but this is going to be necessary. If life is, uh, is going to continue, it cannot hang around a single star right? because stars just don't live for long enough. Life is going to have to move from one star to the other. And so what we're going to have, hopefully, fingers crossed, is that life will, you know, humans or descendants of humans or maybe the cockroaches, will develop technology that allows them to travel to other stars. Okay? That's the only way that life is going to be able to protect itself as the universe evolves. Now, the technology required for traveling to stars is hard. We know we can't do it at the moment. Okay? We just do not have the technology. But as I said, there's a lot of time between now and a few billion years, so hopefully that kind of thing can be developed. But you might sort of think, well, if I'm going to travel between the individual stars in our own Milky Way galaxy, then how about I, I go large? How about instead of just roaming the stars around here, I think of jumping between galaxies. Okay? So, you know, I've got... Uh, Billions of galaxies in the universe, they're quite a large distance away, but again, as technology evolves, it might become possible that we travel from one galaxy to the next galaxy. And the more life spreads, of course, the more chance it has of surviving into the future universe. The big problem is, is that if you're going to do that, you better start relatively now-ish. Why? Well, because it's not going to be possible when we get up to the next step, so now we're out to about 100 billion years. Why is that? Well, as I mentioned at the start, what we've realized is that our universe today is dominated by this strange stuff that we don't really know what it is, called 
dark energy, okay? We know it exists because we see the expansion of the universe accelerating. So something is there that's causing the universe to do that, but we don't know what it is. But it's dominating. 70% of all energy in the universe appears to be in this dark energy. And as time goes on, that percentage increases until very close to, I don't know, not too far into the future, it's going to be effectively 100%. What that does is drive the expansion faster and faster and faster, which means that distant objects move away from us faster and faster. Until eventually they're moving so fast that any light signals that they try to send us never reach here, right? Because the universe is expanding so quickly in between the distant object and us. And that means that basically by the time we get to roughly 100 billion years, then what's going to happen is that our distant universe is going to start to fade from view. So firstly, the most distant galaxies we see will basically freeze and then become invisible, and then the more nearby galaxies, until at 100 billion years, the only thing we can see are stars near us in our, our leftover galaxy. Everything else is now accelerating away from us so fast that we will never see it again. So any species or civilization that arises in this time in the universe will never come to the conclusion that we live in an expanding universe. Why? Well, they take their telescopes, they look at the sky, and they say, what do we see? Oh, we just see stars in the nearby universe, and everything else is inky blackness. No evidence that there's expansion. No, there will be no future Edwin Hubble who measures the redshift of galaxies because there will be no galaxies to see. That also means that life then is isolated. It's now stuck here on this galaxy, Milkometer, right? or in the other galaxies, but now they are separated that they will never ever have contact ever again. So life is going to have to deal with what's going on here if it's going to survive into the long and distant future of the universe. So what's next? So we're going to now take another big jump. We're going to move from 100 billion years out to roughly 10 trillion years, okay? So the universe sits there evolving. What we're going to see now is we're going to see that uh, remnant galaxy uh, of the Milky Way and Andromeda as they merged. And as I said, when they, they merge, they create lots of uh, hot blue stars that live for a very short time before exploding. So all the blue stars live for 10 million years and then explode and they're gone. Then stars like our sun reach the end of their lives, right? So these two are getting older and older and they die. Now, unlike the Milky Way, which has lots of gas and can produce new stars, this leftover object, that used up all its gas in that one burst during the interaction. So there's no new stars born. And all you have is this continuous death of stars as they get older and older and older. And in fact, there's a, a, an interesting relationship with stars is that the bigger the star, the shorter it lives. So the big stars live for a few million years. Stars the size of the sun live for a few billion years. And tiny stars, these little red dwarf stars, they live for trillions of years. So what we're going to have is the stars continuously dying, and our patch of the universe is going to become redder and redder as these little faint red dwarf stars are the only things left. Okay? They too, of course, will be getting older and the galaxy will continuously fade over time. Now, you might say, well, okay, like this, this object that collided, it produced many hundreds of uh, billions of stars all moving around. You've still got lots of these red dwarfs. You think, oh, that's not so bad for life. But there's... Red dwarfs are not friendly stars. What we've come to realize quite recently is that red dwarf stars, even though they look nice and quiet and sedate, are actually quite violent and active places. All right? These stars, instead of just sitting there and nicely putting out energy over their trillions of years, what they do is they um, often have big solar flares. They have big bursts of energy. And it's thought that those bursts of energy continuously sterilize any planets that are orbiting that star. So it's going to be very hard for life to evolve afresh 
on planets orbiting red dwarf stars. But if life has survived from our period into this distant part of the universe, they're going to have to rely on the uh, energy that's generated by these red dwarf stars to keep them going. Now, as I mentioned, these stars are small, these stars are faint, and so they don't put out a lot of energy compared to a star like the sun. So any life in the future part of the universe is going to have to work very hard to become very efficient at collecting energy and using that energy. And there's been a number of suggestions on what you would do. I'll just put up this picture because I think it's pretty. This is a Dyson sphere. Now, a Dyson sphere is a simple idea. You have a future civilization that can do lots of difficult things. We won't talk about how they do it. We'll just pretend that they can. And they find a star, and they want to be very efficient in using the energy of the star. So instead of sitting on a planet, you build a big sort of enclosure around the star. That way, you capture all of the starlight. You can use that starlight to run your life, and you can expend waste heat out into the universe. So that's essentially what you would probably want to do with a red dwarf star, right? You have a red dwarf star, it's got a very little amount of energy, but if you can try and capture all of that energy in one of these Dyson spheres, then maybe you can continue to power life into the future. The next thing that you might need to do is possibly a little more radical. And the big problem is, is that this is highly inefficient. I don't mean just me. Okay? I mean, all of us, right? Human, living biological life is highly inefficient, right? Given the thought processes that we generate, that um, all of the energy we need to take in and all of the various things we need to do to keep us alive is, is wasteful in terms of energy. So energy is now becoming the rare commodity in the universe. And you might decide that, essentially, that you may want to do away with biological forms of life and move into a more efficient form of life, which effectively is a computational, electronic form of life. Now, of course, uh, there's a few problems with all of that. Number one, we don't know what consciousness is, so how you could take consciousness and plonk it on a computer and say, there I am, is an unsolved problem. But people think that this is you know, a possibility once computers get smart enough and fast enough that maybe you could have the equivalent of consciousness on a computer. And that consciousness, compared to the amount of energy we need to keep going, would be highly energy efficient. Okay? You would need a lot less energy to run a computer with you on it rather than having you. So there might be a move away from the actual physical life into more electronic life. There's, this is the realm loved by philosophers. Okay? They, they love talking about this stuff. Pointed out, they point out that if this is the case, that in the future we move on to an electronic form of life which is much more energy efficient, then it would be very easy to generate a huge number of individual conscious life forms on your computer, right? because they're so cheap compared to having biological life forms. And they say that over the entire history of the universe, then the most numerous life form might be computational life somewhere near the time where we're talking about here where the universe is now dominated by red dwarfs. And that we effectively are just at the start of life and most life is yet to come. Other people counter and say, well, maybe we are the computational life running on a computer around a red dwarf star. Which makes you think that if if this is a synthetic reality, what must real reality be like? Let's not worry about that too much now. Anyway, so life will have to do something kind of radical if it's going to be able to efficiently use energy and survive into the future. But again, there's a problem. We're going to go on a factor of 10 out to 10 trillion years, and there will come a time when there will be the last star in the observable universe there will be one star left, okay? And that one star, once it gets to around 100 tr trillion years old, okay, it will run out of hydrogen in its core, and it will, again, go through this sort of like internal sort of rejigging and try to burn helium. But these stars are small, so they settle down for a very brief period, and they become a blue dwarf star. 
for a very, very short period of time until essentially they just go, this is too hard, and give up, okay? So the nuclear reactions that power the star basically stop. And what happens then is that the star shrinks because gravity wins, there's no radiation pushing outwards, so the star shrinks down and down and down, and what you're left with is a white dwarf. And a white dwarf is a dead star. It's not generating new energy, all it does is sit there and cool. Okay, so it cools through from white, through visible, into the infrared, into the radio, and then effectively disappears. So what we've got is that we will get to a period where our universe will just have these dead hearts of stars floating around. And there'll be billions of them, but there will be no more starlight. The only energy that we get will be from these dead star hearts. Life is going to struggle, right? Even a Dyson sphere around a dead star is going to pick up very little energy. And here we run into realms of rampant speculation. If you're going to have life in this universe, it's going to have to seek out energy wherever it can find it. And maybe instead of having life concentrated into single Dyson spheres, you spread it out into something that looks like a cloud. Now, this is actually an interstellar cloud in our own Milky Way. This is not a depiction of a cloud of life in the future. But this is an idea people have had, is that maybe life is distributed and grabs bits of energy where it can, and it uses that to power itself. And it's not a new idea, right? Um, there's a, a book by Fred Hoyle, who was one of the greatest astronomers of the last century, a British astronomer, called The Black Cloud where he had this idea that these clouds of interstellar gas, they, they could be thinking beings. They have very slow processes where they somehow send information back and forth, and they power themselves in our time by going close to stars, which is how the problem starts in the book. This black cloud comes to our sun to get some more energy. But it might be that in the future, our life could be spread out and grab all the little bits of energy spread around and continue to drive itself. So, maybe that's it, right? We get to a point now where all our stars are dead. What, what's left for the universe? Well, now we have to worry about something kind of fundamental, and that's the stability of matter, right? This table seems pretty solid. I think we would all be rather amazed if this table suddenly evaporated into nothingness in front of our eyes, right? We, we think of matter as being a solid, long-lived Object. Now, we know that matter isn't purely uh, stable because we have radioactivity, and you can have one element change into another element, so uranium can decay into other elements through radioactive decay. But what of the bits that make up atoms? Are they stable on very long timescales? So what we're going to do now is we're going to take a really big jump, right? So here we are at 100 trillion years, we're going to jump out to 100 nonillion years, which apparently is a word, okay? So we're jumping out to 10 to the 32 years. And what we're going to do is think about an atom. So what we're going to do is we're just going to zoom in on a single atom here, okay? So everyone remembers their high school chemistry and high school physics, yes? That was not very enthusiastic. <laughs> anyway, let's try and recap, right? What we've got in an atom, we have electrons moving around the outside. So we have clouds of electrons zipping around at very high speeds. And electrons are tiny things, they weigh almost nothing. But if we keep going down deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into the heart of an atom, what we eventually find is the atomic nucleus. Okay? Now, the scales here are incredible. The scale of an atom to the scale of a nucleus is the same as the scale of a cathedral to the scale of a fly. Right? That's how big the nucleus of each of your atoms are. And the rest of your atoms are empty space. So most of you is just empty space. Your mass is in all of the nuclei in your, uh, in your atoms. When we look at an atom, we see that it's made up of a few particles. We have uh, two of them. We have the neutron, colored blue, so named because it's neutral, and the proton, colored red, which carries a positive charge. And it's the protons and the electrons interacting which hold the atom together. What holds the nucleus together is that yellow stuff. That's the strong force. And so the strong force holds all those protons in this very tight bundle at the center of your atom. 
Now, if I take a neutron and I put it to the side and I wait, after about 15 minutes, the neutron decays. The neutron will turn into a proton, an electron, and a neutrino. So it will decay. And it can do that through Einstein's e equals mc squared. Neutrons are more massive than protons, so there's enough energy there for the neutron to turn into the proton plus a few other things. Now, if we take a proton and put it to the side, protons have less mass. And if we do the calculations and worry about quantum mechanics, it looks like protons should be stable. If I put a proton there, it should stay there forever. Except, again, there's a problem with that. And the problem is, is that there is matter in the universe. Why is that a problem? Well, when we use our laws of physics to predict the early universe, when the universe was born, there should have been equal amounts of matter and antimatter. As the universe cooled down, the matter and antimatter annihilate, leaving no matter in the universe today. Yet when I look around this room, I see lots of matter. When I look through a telescope, I see lots of matter. I don't see lots of antimatter. So something happened in the early universe which meant there was more matter than antimatter. And so what we think is that there was an additional force, one that we don't quite understand, that sort of treated matter different to antimatter, which made more matter in the universe than antimatter. Okay? That's all well and good. The big thing is, is that if that force still exists, then it has a consequence. And that consequence is, is that protons should eventually decay. And we've tried to look for proton decay, and we don't look at it by taking one proton and looking, because that would take a long time. You take lots of protons, and you stare at them, and you look for any of them decaying. We haven't seen it yet, but it's thought that on this time scale of 10 to the 32 years, protons will decay. I'll just give you a little illustration. All right, so this is what a proton looks like. It's not a fundamental particle. It's got quarks buzzing around inside. But after around 10 to the 32 years, two of those quarks will interact via this unknown force. Okay, so you have to wait a long time. Eventually, this force kicks in. Two of the quarks will interact. The proton goes into a state that it's never been in before, and it decays. It decays into two photons, which fly off in one direction, and a positron, which flies off in another. What that means is that on this time scale of 10 to the 32 years, matter will melt. Okay? All of the atoms in here will just steadily disintegrate away. So if I waited long enough, this desk would ev evaporate. I'd have to wait 10 to the 32 years, and that's quite a long time. But that's ultimately the fate of what's going to happen to uh, the matter in the universe. Now, life could try and grab on to that energy and continue going, but things are now starting to get difficult. Right? You can pick up these teeny bits of energy, and you can use it to drive your life, but then you realize that your own protons are also decaying. So then you've got to come up with a way to make new protons, because they will last a long time. But to make new protons, you need more energy. So where do you get the energy? So there's one source left. We haven't really mentioned them very much, but that's black holes. I mentioned that there was a big black hole at the center of the Milky Way. And that other black holes are formed when stars die. So you create these black holes, these completely collapsed massive objects down into points. They've got very strong gravitational fields, and so you can extract energy from them. Okay? You could drop things into them. Yeah, think about it this way, right? If, if you've got a black hole, I've got a fishing rod, I've got a rock on the end of the fishing line, I drop that rock in, in it falls, the spindle spins around, I could extract that energy and run the TV and watch the cricket, or something like that, right? But you, there are lots of ways of extracting energy from black holes. And they will still be there in the dark. So you might be able to come up with a method to use that extra energy to keep life going. Except, of course, there's a problem. And the problem is the ghost of Stephen Hawking. Right? Why? Well, what's Stephen Hawking famous for in terms of his scientific work? He's famous for looking at black holes and linking black holes with quantum mechanics. And what he showed is that black holes aren't really black. If you take quantum mechanics into account at the edge of the black hole, they emit teeny bits of energy, okay? tiny amounts. But over time, that energy which is emitted takes away some of the mass from the center of the black hole. Now, over immense timescales, 10 to the 100 years, a big black hole like the one in the center of the Milky Way galaxy will start to lose enough energy that it actually starts to sh shrink very rapidly. And what you get is that if you have black holes in the universe, 
they undergo what's known as Hawking radiation. As they shrink, they emit more energy, and as they emit more energy, they shrink even more. So they get this runaback, run, uh, runaway feedback, which essentially drives them down to a point, and then they explode, and all of their final mass is released in a burst. And this will happen to all the black holes. Right? All the black holes will be emitting uh, this, this Hawking radiation. So there will be these continuous random bursts of energy in the universe. Now, if you're a... If you are a creature and you are living in this distant part of the universe, maybe you can harness this energy as black holes wink out of existence. But I think it's going to be very, very hard work. Right? Very, very hard work. And effectively, what you're doing is you're only putting off the inevitable. Because once these black holes have evaporated, right, and they're gone, once all the stars are dead and their stellar hearts have dissolved, there is nothing left, right? There's no matter in the form of stars, etc. There's only electrons and positrons buzzing around. There are no sources of energy, only this soup of photons bubbling through the universe. So the universe reaches this rather lovely named state known as the heat death of the universe. And what that means is we've got to a point where there's no usable energy left for life. This is probably it. This is probably as far as life is going to be able to push it into the universe. Now, we don't want to finish on a sad note, do we? No? We have also entered the realm of speculation and speculative physics. So let's be speculative on the positive side, shall we? We can't really be positive about life in this universe, but we can be positive about the universe itself. And... There are a lot of ideas that if we really stretch the age of the universe out 10 to the 2,000 plus years, that the universe might actually manage to change its spots. I mentioned there's this dark energy in the universe, that this material is there and there's energy associated with space. But there are lots of ideas that that energy might be able to decay and go from one energy state down to another energy state. And if it does that, then that release of energy as the universe essentially um, changes its energy state will give a new burst to the expansion of the universe. Okay? So it will be like when you open you know, a bottle of, of fizzy water, you get all these sites where the bubbles form, nucleation sites. That's what they think will happen to the universe, that individual places of the universe, there will be this change of energy, and you'd get these rapidly expanding patches of the universe. And these rapidly expanding patches would effectively be new universes. Now, again, speculation runs free. We don't know what kind of universes are going to be created. They might be universes completely different to our own, in terms of the laws of physics and how the universe is composed of matter and radiation, or... They could be just like our own, and the cycle could start again. You could get matter forming from this reborn universe, falling together, giving us stars, the stars evolving, and giving us new bursts of life in whatever universe follows this one, which is a reasonably happy ending, isn't it? Anyway, I'm going to finish essentially with a quote from one of my favorite authors. So this is, this is Douglas Adams. Right? And there is a theory which states that if ever anyone discovers exactly what the universe is for and why it is here, it will instantly disappear and be replaced by something even more bizarre and inexplicable. We may never actually answer the deep philosophical questions, but we may live in a universe which is replaced by something bizarre and even more inexplicable. But the line that really got me when I read this was the next one. There is another theory that this has already happened. And that this universe itself could have been born from the death of a previous universe. And we may have this endless cycles of universes and life going on from infinity in the past to infinity in the future. So, it's almost sort of like a Buddhist finish in there. But um, that, was a, that was a semi positive note. I'll finish, though, by putting up a picture of what the Earth's going to look like in roughly 7 billion years' time. <laughs> and finish there. So, thank you.
things. One, you said you were going to end it on a happy note, so you put a picture of the <laughs> yeah, well, no, but we, but, we, but we've gone by this point, right? We've left yeah. and we're happily living somewhere else in the galaxy. So. <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> and the other thing is, when you're saying about creating more protons and stuff, and then everything going to, well, black holes and doom and stuff, yeah. but... Wouldn't there be more matter so you could potentially build more stars then? Once you've gotten enough more matter, since you make the protons to gain more energy in different ways, basically. Uh, yes, except you, you do run into a problem. And the problem is, is that anything you do it tends to be inefficient. So if you ask how much energy you would need to create enough protons to create a star, etc., it's more energy than you get from the star itself. So it, it, it's. So you have more than one star then. And but uh, future technology, we might be able to. Yeah, that's, that's what I do. I normally just say engineering problem and let the engineer solve it. <laughs> but there is a famous saying, and it's that you cannot beat the laws of thermodynamics. They win every time. And they discovered this when they built steam trains and suddenly realized you can't run steam trains as fast and as efficient as you want. It's the same rules that govern everything else in the universe. Things are inefficient, you lose energy, and so. Um, <laughs> so it should be hard work to make more stars. And you had another very quick question, right? <laughs> if you couldn't beat them at the game of, well, if you couldn't beat the laws of physics or whatever it was you said, change it, basically. It's yes, been, been yes, trillions, change the laws of, of physics. <laughs> Not change them, but change some way to do it. It's been trillions of years, really. Uh, that's well, right. It, and it could, be, really it could be that we've got thermodynamics wrong. But it would be a surprise, because it's pretty fundamental. I so. don't think I wanted that right. <laughs> Can we have this guy in the middle, and then we'll have uh, this question up here as well. Please. When you work of the death of life in seven billion years, do you not um, take the theory, which I've read, that in 500 to a billion years, the Earth will be getting too hot for life? You put it much further back. Oh, well, they're... they're Exactly when Earth will become uninhabitable as the sun expands is not a very well-defined thing. We actually know that a few, a couple of billion years before the sun basically throws off its outer layers, that it will have gotten so bright that it will have radically affected the atmosphere, probably boiled off the oceans, but life may still survive underground at that point. But when the sun engulfs the Earth, all bets are off. Uh, the Earth will vanish from being. Oh, we've got one up there. Okay. Uh, hello. Um, I've got something to do with the conservation of energy. If you've got a photon that leaves a far distant uh, sun yes. that's identical to our sun, yes. it leaves the surface, it's the same process as on that sun as on our sun. Yes. It leaves the surface, it's red shifted, so it's lost energy. Where's that energy gone? I love this question. Um, okay. Can I give you some bad news to start with? What, Effective, more, what more bad news? More bad news. <laughs> Effectively, uh, you've been lied to all the way through school. Now, I know this comes as a surprise. That was right? a long time ago. Yeah. So, 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 conservation of energy. Conservation of energy is a very well-defined thing in a very well-defined system. The one place that conservation of energy does not hold is in the universe itself. The universe, we could do a GR lecture, I've got all night, right? The universe itself does not obey a conservation of energy law because it changes over time. And that, that change over time gives you a non-conservation of energy. So the energy doesn't go anywhere, it's just not conserved when you deal with processes involving changes of the entire universe. I'm talking to a light up there. I have no idea if I'm looking at you or... Oh, there you are. Okay. So, so, yeah. So, conservation of energy does not work in an expanding universe. This leads to many arguments, especially in the pub. But it's <laughs> what the mathematics show. Are you... <laughs> no. <laughs> There's a, a question from up here. Can we get... Is anyone more... Any more hands up? Okay. Um, oh. Mine is... Uh... Okay. Really, uh, why would you want to interfere with the evolution of new species um, and new plants by essentially saving humankind? Why would you want to? Yes. 
Well, for, for me, uh, so, um, for, for me, the evidence is growing that at, the, at this time, there's only one place in the universe where there's anything remotely close to intelligent life, and that's here. Life might be common in the universe, but it's probably going to be more similar to pond scum than living beings. And I actually think we have a bit of an imperative that if we can continue and can continue to think and wonder about the universe, that we should. Um, that's just my personal feeling, though. As I mentioned, I'm going to give the cockroaches a chance, all right? <laughs> so, I, I'm, and I, I, I am firmly not advocating that I, I, it's guaranteed that we will be the dominant species on this planet in a million years. It could be something completely different. But I said, this is the planet that has life on it. So hopefully there would be this imperative for life to keep going. I would hate to get to seven billion years in it and life just going, oh, bugger. <laughs> <laughs> There was another a mic over here somewhere. Do you have any more questions? There's one up there, Martin. Okay, should we, should we just have this chap down here and then we'll go up? Um, there was a theory that the expansion of the universe would stop and that there would be a contraction and that the universe would disappear in a big crunch. Is that dead now? Effectively, yes. Since the discovery of dark energy, the idea that the universe will undergo a collapse in the sense of born collapse. There's not enough matter in the universe to provide enough gravity to stop the expansion and pull it back. Now, there are some ideas, like what I mentioned, where the universe could have a rebirth, but it will not go through a crunch to get there. If you wanted to make a big crunch, you'd have to magic matter into the universe to provide extra gravitational pull. Again, I'm talking to somebody, I'm not sure if it's the person who asked the question, I got blinded by staring at the light and I can't see anything. <laughs> but um, there, there's not, there doesn't appear to be enough matter in the universe to cause the expansion to turn around and go back down to a, a big crunch. I, I, in fact, it's kind of interesting, when you look at the textbooks that were written roughly you know, 50 years ago, people talked about the various options of an open universe, a, a universe which is critical and one that will crunch. And basically, if you read the textbook, they said, we need to find out how much matter and radiation and energy is in the universe. What we did at the end of the 90s is we found out how much matter, radiation, and stuff is in the universe to tell us that we're not going to crunch, we haven't got an open universe, we do have something that appears that it's uh, going to go through uh, this deceleration, then acceleration into the future. Yeah. So astronomers did a good job, that's all I was saying. Did you have another question up there? Okay, and then there's a uh, second row from the back, middle sector. It was actually the same question. I was going to ask about the big bounce, but I think that's the same as the big crunch, isn't it? Yes. A big crunch is uh, a, a crunch without a bounce. So, <laughs> again, I'm not sure who I'm looking at. This is very, very is, disconcerting. Uh, Geraint, is there not just another universe we can tunnel through to? Well, ah, so the, the notion of there being other universes is, is it's, again, it's a bit of an ugly ground at the moment between philosophers, astronomers, particle physicists. People do think that there's, there's potentially this thing called the multiverse, uh, that they, you have different universes all sort of evolving on their own. Nobody knows if you could tunnel between these universes, but when we understand gravity and quantum mechanics well enough, maybe there will be a way to distort gravity to allow us to do that, but at the moment it seems impossible. If they're there. If they're there, <laughs> yes, and that, that's another ugly argument. Dark energy, and mm -hmm. about 70% of the universe is dark energy, and we, we don't really know what it is. And then later on you mentioned um, stars moving away so quickly that, we, that people in the future wouldn't be able to see them. That's right. So to me there seems to be a correlation there. Um, could you know, people in the future, they're looking at that they perhaps know that there's something there but can't see them, but that's what we're experiencing now. That, that's right, but they will get to a point when there will be nothing left to see. <coughs> so once you've reached that point, once everything beyond our local part of the universe has gone, the night sky beyond the local stars will be completely and utterly blank and black. There will be nothing to see. So you don't have anything to get a handle on. You can't say, oh, that object is moving away from me because you can't see anything. It seems to, it seems to me that we're having the same mystery now. We, we, we can't, we, we have well, 
we can see objects moving away from us. We know that something must be causing that acceleration. What we can't work out is what that stuff is that is in the universe. But we, we can infer it from what we see going on in the distant universe. But in the future, if you can't see the distant universe, how are you going to infer that this stuff is there? It will still be there, uh, but you won't be able to basically measure it because you won't see anything else out there in the distant universe. Thank you. There's a question, just uh, if you go next row and along a little bit, and then... I, I meant a little bit further along, actually. Um, <laughs> we'll come, don't worry, we'll come back to you, but um, pass along just four people and then back one, and then I'm sure you can do the this reverse. Is like, this is like battleships. <laughs> so I'm doing my GCSEs at the moment, and my textbook still includes things like the Big Crunch, and obviously we're still using kind of Newtonian gravitation as opposed to kind of spatial relativity. Do you have any other examples in physics where we're basically being lied to about what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm a, I said I'm a, uh, I'm a professor of astrophysics at the University of Sydney. I teach undergraduate physics. I feel an awful lot of what I teach is saying, forget what you learned at high school. So that, um, it's qu quantum mechanics is a big one. Uh, you know, uh, how long have you got? Uh, you know, I get students coming up to me who think that electrons are really particles that sometimes behave as waves, and light is really a wave that sometimes behaves as particles, whereas quantum mechanics says that it's neither of those. They both exhibit particle and wave kind of behaviors. Uh, yeah, the entire gravity thing is, and cosmology is, is, is very messed up. Um, <laughs> after you've done your GCSEs, and you're going to university, prepare to continuously change your worldview on what physics is telling us. I hope that helps. <laughs> it becomes more <laughs> exciting. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> Go ahead. Dark energy, you know, the fact that there's, whatever it is, 70% or so of the universe is this dark energy that it seems we don't really know much about. Uh, that seems a bit troubling. Are, 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 are Just a little. Are there some ideas as to what it might be? Oh. Um, and, and, you know, what is the key observational evidence for it? Is it just that the universe, we see it expanding and therefore there must be something making it expand? Or uh, No, it's not the expansion, it's the acceleration of the expansion. That's the important part. So we see the expansion accelerating. We can measure that by looking at uh, distant exploding stars, distant supernova. That tells us that there, there must be stuff in the universe. So the question of what it is is an interesting one. You sort of think that... Or maybe, you know, we're all sitting there going, what is it, what is it, we don't know. The big problem is, is that when you have this kind of mystery, it's the realm that theorists run to. Because you can write papers on, it could be this, it could be that, it could be this, it could be that. And with all kinds of potential tests that we can't do yet. So we don't know which of the many thousands of ideas is potentially correct, or if any of them are. The, one of the favored examples is that it's actually a property of the vacuum itself. And what I mean by that is that if I have a box, uh, and it's good old classical Newtonian physics, and I said to you, there's nothing in the box, right? No air, etc. There's a vacuum in the box. And I ask you, what's in the box? You just go, nothing. And everyone just goes, like, that's great. And then I say, right, now I'm going to introduce quantum mechanics. There's still nothing in the box. And they say, what's in the box? And you go, nothing. And you're wrong. There's energy in the box. Because quantum mechanics allows energy, basically, to pop in and out of existence, right? So you get these fluctuations in energy. Now, that's, that's observed. You can observe that in the lab, right? It's, it's a real thing. It's not something that a bunch of particle physicists who were drunk down the pub made up just so we have something to talk about. If you don't include the fact that the vacuum itself has energy, you cannot accurately predict the spectrum of light you get from a hydrogen atom. Right? It's the simplest test. You've got to include it. So it's there. And it has the right properties to cause the universe to accelerate. The big problem is, is that if that is the source of dark energy, when we calculate theoretically how much energy we should have compared to how much we can see, we're out by a tiny factor of around 10 to the 120. <laughs> okay? So it's a great idea. Except it doesn't quite work because of this huge factor. But that's the favorite idea, right? Uh, it's, the person did the GCSE, we need help, so can you hurry up and finish? <laughs> <laughs> so we have one, two, three, and four, and I don't know, and five. I don't know where the microphones are, so 
Whoever gets them first, I say. The chap over here could do with the mic. Right. Um, uh, another question about dark energy. People I love dark energy. <laughs> I did read that it was um, that the expansion of the universe was speeding up. Yes, accelerating. Right. And I did read that there was going to be um, a big rip. Ah. It was going to rip apart. Is that still going to happen? And if so, when? <laughs> All right, so, as I mentioned, there are lots of ideas about what dark energy is. One of these, right, so imagine I've got a big row of dark energy ideas. The favored one is one here, one that Einstein came up with called the cosmological constant. We like that one, because it's a nice, simple one. These on this side, they're interesting too. These on this side, they have a special name. They're called phantom energy, right? Why? Because they cause the expansion to accelerate faster and faster and faster, such that the expansion of the universe would firstly rip apart our galaxy, separate the stars, and then would rip apart the stars, and then rip apart the atoms that make up the stars. So this is this notion of the big rip. But we don't know where along here we sit with our idea, where, with what dark energy is. So it's a theoretical idea, but we can't tell this theoretical idea from that theoretical idea, from that one with the observations that we currently have. So it's possible. If you spoke to most people, they'd say, nah, there's something weird about phantom energy. We, we don't really worry about it too much. I said it's this cosmological constant where people have their money. We have the lad in the T-shirt. Um, so, say we've got to however many billion years in the future where uh, we can only see our local group uh, mm -hmm. because the rest of the other stars are too far away. Say in, in another local group, um, a photon comes out of a star and it's, it's traveling at the speed of light and the other star is moving away from us because surely nothing can move faster than the speed of light. How can we be moving fast enough away from that photon that that photon will never reach us? Okay. Did you hear the answer to about energy conservation? Yeah. It's basically the same answer. Um, <laughs> the, the restriction on the speed of light doesn't hold for an expanding universe. That, so let, let's, let, let me just be clear, right, what I mean by that. When I say nothing can go faster than the speed of light, that means if I'm in this room and there's a beam of light and I try to outrun it, it will win every time, probably by quite a bit, right? <laughs> but because the universe is expanding, then if I fire a light beam from here over to there, asking them over there how fast is that light beam moving with respect to you, it's not necessarily the speed of light because space is expanding in between. So essentially, the expansion of space is like trying to run on a, a stretchy piece of, of rubber, right? Is that your target is moving away from you no matter how fast you run. So uh, th there, there will always be photons traveling towards things, but they would never get there because the space in between just keeps getting bigger and bigger, faster than they can cover the distance. You should do some cosmology, it's great. <laughs> hey, do we have any other questions or any people with microphones? Uh, the question down here, can we have a, one down here in the middle, uh, two rows back as well? Okay, wait. Uh, not sure how far that's. Do you want to go first, and then we'll come to you? Um, thank you. Um, I must say, I've always thought of uh, dark energy as the dirty socks in the cosmic laundry basket, and when they're left alone, they blow the, the lid off. Uh, and if we're talking about continuous creation of space time, I'd have thought Hoyle was turning in his grave um, on having been argued out of continuous creation of matter. Um, if all we know about it is its observed facts, um, is it isotropic uh, in terms of the acceleration? Did the acceleration start at some time in the past, and is it changing? So, th three questions in one, right? So, you know, you're getting your money's worth here. Number one, is it isotropic? As far as we can tell, yes, because if we look at supernova on one side of the sky and supernova on the other side of the sky, they look to be doing the same kind of thing. Um, I've forgotten what the other two questions were. <laughs> yes, um, so dark energy's always been here. The question is how much does it dominate? 
So what has happened in the universe is dark energy has sat here, matter has continuously thinned out. As matter has thinned out, its gravitational pull has gotten weaker relative to the expansion due to um, dark energy, and they passed a point roughly half the age of the universe ago where dark energy started to dominate and the expansion has started to accelerate. And it looks like that point is the same when you look in different directions on the sky, which is why we think it's homogeneous. I think there was a third part which was about the rate, whether it's been constant. As far as we can tell, I said we have a big list of potential um, theories. Some of these theories have dark energy changing with time, some of them don't. This one here, which is a cosmological constant, which hasn't changed over the age of the universe, is the one which is currently the best description of the data, as far as we know. So it doesn't look like it's changed its spots at all. Do you have dark energy explaining cosmic inflation? Ooh, that's, a, ooh, that's another good question. So, uh, yes. So there was this rapid burst of inflation when the universe was born. The question is, is um, was dark energy present there? It would have to be present at a higher value to cause that acceleration. And then it's dived off down to nothing and is now coming back. Or were they two separate things? And at the moment, we can't tell. There are some that think that that uh, inflation at the start and the expansion today is somehow related to the Higgs field, which existed all through the universe. But again, the mechanisms, there's something missing. We haven't got the full picture, but some people think that they could be related. Question here. Simple one. What is the universe expanding into? <laughs> OK. What, what is the economy expanding into? There we go. I would say nothing. Though, yeah. So, so, so but, but I will try not to be, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a very serious question, right? What is the universe expanded into? So when I write down my equations of relativity, okay, I have various bits and pieces to work with. I have a time, and I have three spatial dimensions, and I have the other bits and pieces that tell me how gravity works. Okay? That time and that x, y, z covers all points at all times in the universe. There is nothing extra. So inside general relativity, there, I mean, if you want to talk about somewhere else, there are no coordinates I could talk about because it's not part of the mathematical theory. Okay? So in terms of general relativity, everything is in that set of mathematics. Okay? So either you've got a universe which is infinite in extent, or you have a closed universe, like a sphere, and you can talk about every point on that sphere, but you can never talk about points inside and outside because that's not part of the mathematics. Now, some people have this idea uh, from, from M theory, where M stands for mm, um, <laughs> that our universe exi potentially exists in a higher number of dimensions, you know, 20 dimensions or something, and that our universe would be a sheet or something in 20 dimensions. But when you write down the mathematics of that, you've got T, X, Y, Z, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You can talk about points outside of our universe because you have coordinates for outside of our universe. Uh, but that's just an idea of what the potential universe could be. So it could be expanding in, in, in M theory, or it might not be a question which has an answer given the mathematics we do. Wasn't that simple a question, was it? <laughs> Another hand up over there. Any more hands? Ah, yes, down here. Do you want to go first? You'll probably get your mic soonest, I think. Hello. <laughs> that was very odd. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wonder what's leading you to the conclusion that while their life might be abundant in the universe, intelligent life might only be here. Because... For two things. Number one, we don't know why we're an intelligent species. We don't even know if we're an intelligent species. But we don't know why. Because evolutionary, it's a very, very, you know, select thing to be is a big-brained creature that solves problems. Right? As we know, for many creatures, you can have reasonably simple brains and just be stronger than the competitor. So why, why us now having this ability to ponder the universe, okay? It, and if you talk to people that study evolutionary biology, right, you, they say to you, well, if you ran the Earth again, then maybe you would never get an intelligent species. Maybe everything's fine just basically eating the thing which is slower and weaker than it. Right? You won't have to have... 
this big brain to think about um, problems. The other reason is the fact that we see no evidence of any other intelligent life. Not including the Americans who meet people on dark roads, right? But when we look out into space, if there was, if there, so the idea is simple, right? Is if you have an intelligent species, eventually it gets off its planet and it would colonize stars. So how long would it take a species like us to colonize the entire galaxy? It's so roughly 10 million years. Now you might say, 10 million years, that sounds like a long time, but it's nothing compared to the lifespan of a galaxy. Life's been on Earth for billions of years, right? So if intelligent life had risen earlier, you would expect that life to have gone off and established itself in the universe. We see no signs of intelligent life anywhere we look. We would, we would see them using starlight. This is my favorite one. If, if they built Dyson spheres, we would know because there would be no starlight left. They'd be using that starlight and reprocess it into infrared radiation. We see no signatures of Dyson spheres or anything similar. So we have just no evidence at all that there's intelligent life, at least in our galaxy, if not in other galaxies. I think we probably have time for one more, and I think you already have a mic over here, unless there's any more final hands. Okay, let's, and then we'll do the last, okay, last one to you. Do you want to... Do the two, one question and the other, and then great, you can answer both. Okay. Um, you started off telling us about the fact that we didn't fully understand the Big Bang. Mm -hmm. You showed us the new radio telescopes are being built in South Africa and Australia. Yep. Tomorrow, you are in charge of that program. Am I? And I would like Bloody you to hell. tell us what experiments you would set up to improve our knowledge of the Big Bang as well. Okay, let me let that stew, but I do have an yeah. answer. <laughs> and then the question, question here. Um, would it be possible to make another energy slash light source that's not a star, that wouldn't die out so that life could still live forever? Okay, I'll, I'll do this one first. Why not? The thing is, Stars are really good at producing energy because they use nuclear reactions. They're very efficient. The only thing which is more efficient than a star is, well, actually, I should take that back. Stars are not that efficient. But they, if, they, if they're big enough, they, they burn for long enough that you can use them to, uh, to, to generate uh, energy for a long time. The only other thing you could do is use black holes uh, and pour matter into them, and that matter swirls around and gets hotter. The thing is, is that... Um, other than that, what other sources of energy could you use to produce even more condensed energy in a particular place? Other than nuclear reactions, which are the most powerful force in the universe, and gravity, which is exceptionally strong in a black hole because you've got so much mass there, there's nothing else left there to generate huge amounts of energy that we know of. Now, it, that might change into the future if we have... Um, if we have to revise aspects of our laws of physics, if we find out these additional forces. But at the moment, stars are amongst our best bet, as are black holes. And this question, um, if I was put in charge of the SKA, I would say to you, number one, the SKA was not built to study the Big Bang. It was built to study the evolution of the universe after the Big Bang. And I would say to you that the problem is not uh, to do with telescopes. Because we've seen as far as we're ever going to see, right? We've seen the cosmic microwave background. We're not going to see any further. What is missing is the theoretical side. What we need are smart people to think about the problems. And what we need is uh, not old crusties like me whose brains have addled, but we need young people with new ideas to try and put together gravity and quantum mechanics and make them work. Because once we've done that, We'll have the mathematical rules that will allow us to see what happened before the Big Bang. And on that happy note, I think that's where we'll have to wrap it up. I think the one message to take home is that um, for anyone who wants to study cosmology, there's clearly plenty of questions left unanswered. So uh, we need help. <laughs> yeah, thanks to Drake.
Hi all, welcome to Sky for the Month for October 2020. Quite a few things happening this month, so uh, without waffling on, let's move on with it. The highlights for the months of uh, October and early November, uh, until next meeting, uh, the big one this time is Mars at Opposition, which is uh, one of its best, or it is its best spot for viewing. Uh, I believe it's actually appearing quite clear at the moment, a little further from the sun than it was last time, uh, hopefully showing a lot more detail than it did last time. Uh, new moon occurs on the 17th of the 10th, so nice dark skies, uh, particularly uh, for looking at nebulas and uh, deeper sky uh, objects. On the uh, 23rd of uh, the 10th, Jupiter is 2 degrees north of the Moon and Saturn is 3, deg uh, three degrees north of the Moon but uh, Saturn is 3 degrees north of the Moon about 11 hours after Jupiter. Mercury is at inferior conjunction means it's between us and the Sun so you really won't be able to uh, look to uh, view Mercury at that time. Uh, two days later it goes through its ascending node and uh, that's because it actually travels above and below the ecliptic plane, not right on it, which is why we don't get a transit uh, every time Mercury goes past. So in this case, we've missed the transit by about two days. Uh, just for the record, they are quite rare. First of the 11th, we have a full moon, uh, and the day after, Uranus is at uh, opposition, which is its best position for viewing as well. Comets Howell and Enki pass within 0.7 degrees of each other, but uh, they're both around 10th uh, uh, to about 13th magnitude. You would need a fairly sizable scope to be able to see them. I uh, also think they're fairly low on the horizon. And on the 11th to the 11th, Mercury is at its greatest elongation west, uh, which means it's as far angled off from the Sun. Uh, so better viewing, although uh, it is fairly close to the ecliptic plane and so it won't get very high in the sky, so probably not really worth getting up uh, early morning to view. Viewing the night sky, uh, looking in the southerly direction towards the South Celestial Pole, you note uh, this month that Southern Cross, uh, including and uh, East Carinae, are, are fairly low on the southern horizon, so unless you have a, a good view of that, it makes it a little difficult to see. However, the Tarantula Nebula, which is in the Large Magellan Cloud, is in a, a fairly good uh, position to, to see, uh, along with uh, 47 Carinae, which is a globular nebula, uh, almost as spectacular as Amiga Centauri. With the constellations, uh, you'll note that Scorpio uh, and Sagittarius are uh, heading towards the western horizon now. Uh, they'll disappear over the summer period. However, that means uh, if you look to the east, you'll have Orion uh, arising, bringing with it at uh, M42, the Orion Nebula, which is uh, quite visible even through a fairly small telescope. Uh, there are other nebulas, uh, such as the Flame and the Horsehead, which are near Orion's belt, but uh, you know, they're, they're very faint nebulas and so somewhat difficult to see uh, with a telescope. Looking uh, to the northern horizon, uh, hopefully those some of you have got a very good view of that side. I guess the one that most people will notice is the Andromeda Galaxy there, uh, just above the uh, north symbol. This, uh, this is a large galaxy that's uh, relatively close. It's part of our local group and uh, it is generally quite visible. The only problem being, for most of us in the southern part of uh, Melbourne, we're trying to look at it over the lights of Melbourne. Uh, so it makes it a little bit difficult to see. Uh, if you can find yourself a nice dark northern horizon, uh, you should be able to pick it up. Uh, nothing else in, in particular. You've got uh, 
as I said, Scorpio and uh, Sagittarius heading towards the, uh, the horizon and uh, disappearing for uh, until next year. But as I did say too, it does bring uh, Ryan Nebula uh, into view. So for this month, what are the planets up to? Well, Mercury moves towards Imperial Conjunction on the 26th of October, essentially meaning it's between us and the Sun, so not a very good position to, uh, to view. It uh, transits the ecliptic plane uh, two days after it moves through this uh, conjunction, and so if it hadn't happened two days earlier, we'd have actually got a transit, but uh, that is a rare occurrence. It moves to its maximum elongation uh, on the 11th of November, but due to its close proximity to the ecliptic plane, uh, it will be fairly low on the horizon, so you'll need a, a, a very good uh, eastern horizon view in the early morning to see it. Venus, uh, still a morning object, uh, will be now until it uh, heads through superior conjunction, uh, which is a little bit later. It's uh, currently moving into Leo, and later in the month it will be a few degrees uh, near Regulus, which is the brightest star in the constellation of Leo. Uh, Earth now moving towards the southern hemisphere summer, uh, which basically means the south pole is tilted towards the sun. It also enters the part of its orbit uh, which perihelion occurs and uh, that's one of the reasons the southern summers seem to be a little hotter than those in the north. As for the outer planets, uh, Mars is rising around about 8.30pm, so by around about 10 o'clock it's actually in quite a good position uh, for viewing, particularly on uh, some of the clear nights we've had. If you are actually watching it against its uh, background, it is in uh, what's known as uh, apparent retrograde motion. It's just an optical illusion caused by our relative orbits. And uh, currently sitting in the constellation of Pisces. So if you look up uh, towards the eastern horizon, uh, around about 10 o'clock, you'll see this quite bright orangey disk, well that's Mars. It uh, reaches opposition on the 14th of October, uh, and so that is its uh, best position. I realise uh, not getting much warning of that. Jupiter, uh, still visible uh, in the sky uh, as it moves towards the uh, western horizon. It's, it's still a fair way above the horizon, so it's still uh, very good viewing. Uh, it's also been moving retrograde in apparent sort of stars behind it for the last four months, but it will now resume its uh, normal apparent motion, and uh, this will bring it very close to Saturn in December. Uh, Saturn itself passing the meridian around about 8 p.m. Uh, it also has been in apparent retrograde motion, but as I said, once again, and uh, I may try and explain it at the end of one of these one day, it, uh, it is the relativity of our orbits that causes this apparent retrograde motion. They're not really moving retrograde. In, uh, it's past its opposition now, but being fairly close to Jupiter, it is actually uh, still in a very good uh, viewing sky, uh, not viewing position in the western evening sky. Uh, Uranus, still in Aries. That's not really going to change as uh, we've seen until 2024. It uh, is now rising mid-evening, uh, very close to uh, the tail of Cetus the uh, Whale, and it will reach opposition on the 1st of the 11th. Not that it makes a big difference to uh, Uranus, you will still need a telescope to be able to view it. Uh, Neptune, in Aquarius, it reached opposition on the 12th, and despite this, uh, you will need a fairly sizable telescope probably greater than 8 inches if you uh, have any hope of seeing its largest uh, moon triton. Uh, appearance of the planets for the, for the month. Uh, if you look there at Mercury, you'll notice uh, greatest elongation east, which meant it was good 
evening viewing object on the 2nd of October and uh, it's only 24 days later that it is actually uh, in inferior conjunction. It gives you a bit of an idea of just how rapidly Mercury uh, moves around the Sun. Essentially every 22 days it moves 25% uh, of its orbit. Uh, Venus uh, showing as a, a fairly large or reducing gibbous uh, appearance and uh, it is a morning object. Still fairly bright for those who want to get up and uh, have a look at it. But uh, for those who prefer their viewing in the evening, you'll need to wait until it completes its uh, orbit, heads around uh, to the other side. Mars obviously getting bigger uh, as we approach opposition later this month, uh, the 14th, which is not far off. And uh, I believe it is showing uh, a reasonable amount of detail. Uh, Saturn and Jupiter. Uh, hopefully all been viewing those for the last couple of months. Uh, Saturn is in a beautiful position to view its rings uh, and Jupiter is always spectacular. Uh, Uranus heading into opposition, it's, uh, it's as close to as, it, as it's going to get and uh, with a reasonable sized telescope you should be able to pick Uranus up. Not that there's a lot of detail on it, it appears as a little bit of a bluish green disc. Neptune, very similar, except a lot smaller. Uh, good telescope, you will actually pick up a, a blue dot, and, uh, but not much more. As I said uh, in the previous slide, if you've got a size of a telescope, you may be able to pick up its uh, largest moon triton. And Pluto is not much more than a, a star, and uh, given that it's currently uh, in the Sagittarius area, uh, Good luck trying to pick it out. Okay, as for the other stuff, uh, the comets, uh, the same three that have been appearing in the last couple there. Uh, Comet Howell is now in Sagittarius uh, and moves into Capricorn during November, so it, it's fairly low on the horizon uh, once night time falls. And as it's moving away from the sun, it is expected to fade from ninth magnitude to tenth magnitude. So you will need a, a reasonable telescope to see it. Uh, Pan stars is now in Libra, and uh, so it's very low on the western horizon, uh, probably in the twilight zone. And so very difficult to see given it's tenth magnitude or less. Comet Enki will be very close to Comet Hale uh, on the fifth of the eleventh. Uh, less than a degree separating them. It uh, unfortunately is around about 13th uh, or less magnitude, so uh, probably one for the astrophotographers. They so perhaps want to try and get two comets together. We uh, have five of the minor planets uh, in opposition this month, and uh, if you look at their magnitudes, there's some of the some of the bigger objects uh, in the sky. They uh, only appear fairly small, these are asteroid belt uh, objects and uh, the date that they're in opposition probably uh, need a fairly good telescope to pick them out uh, amongst the Zari backgrounds. Uh, Pluto just passed opposition, uh, transiting the meridian around about 8 uh, p.m. and by transiting the meridian I mean it is due north of us at about 8 p.m. And uh, finally, continuing Steve O's solar system tour, part six, we'll have a quick look at uh, the largest planet in the solar system, which is Jupiter. Uh, Jupiter is quite an interesting planet to look at, given its relative proximity to Earth. Uh, even a modest sized telescope can show quite, uh, quite a bit of detail. The, uh, there's speculation that uh, Jupiter uh, was a failed sun, uh, which is quite valid. Uh, the reason it is a failed sun is it didn't actually gather a sufficient uh, of the material, particularly hydrogen, uh, inherent in the solar system. The uh, main sun grabbed all of it, and uh, there was insufficient for Jupiter to initiate fusion reaction and thus becoming a binary star.
Jupiter is uh, named for the Roman god uh, Jupiter, uh, who was apparently the uh, king of the gods, if you like, known as uh, Zeus in Greek mythology. Largely uh, known as a gas giant, largely consisting of uh, an atmosphere of hydrogen and helium gas, uh, with, they believe, a small solid core, and uh, within it it has more than twice the mass of all the other planets combined. It has a diameter of 142,984 kilometres, and at last counting, 79 moons. The question mark there is they seem to find moons fairly regularly, uh, around <laughs> both Jupiter and Saturn. Its distance from the Sun is a uh, fairly sizable number of kilometres there. For simplification, it equates to uh, 5.2 astronomical units, which means it's about five, just over five times as far from the Sun as what Earth is. It uh, has an orbital period of 12 years, and uh, basically means we'd all be quite young if we lived on Jupiter. Not so many birthdays. It rotates once on its axis every 10 hours, uh, which is what gives it its uh, flattened appearance, or squished appearance, if you like. Uh, best viewed from uh, when it's at opposition, but given its size and proximity, it's actually quite good uh, viewing, uh, particularly in the evening, once it's up uh, and visible to all of us. It uh, has, a, as I said, a flattened disk appearance, uh, slightly flattened at the poles or squished at the poles and a slightly wider equator and this is due to its rapid axial rotation. It uh, across its surface uh, parallel to its uh, equatorial uh, band is a series of uh, coloured bands which even through a modest telescope are quite visible. Slightly bigger telescopes will uh, reveal a giant red spot uh, which is uh, certainly worth uh, trying to trying to find. Uh, other than that, has uh, well, it has 79 moons, but it has four in particular that are quite large and are easily seen even through a modest telescope. And uh, the really keen, the slightly bigger telescope, uh, a lot of transits and configurations uh, around Jupiter, in particular something some people like to have a look at is the shadow transits, or uh, which is cast by a moon passing between Jupiter and the Sun, casting a shadow on its surface. And uh, here is quite a good uh, picture of Jupiter. As you can see, slightly flattened at the poles with a with a bulging waistline there. The bands that I referred to earlier. Um, bands of different colour uh, clouds uh, across the various surface there. The Great Red Spot is visible, believed to be a massive storm, and uh, just to give you an idea of the size, the longest diameter there is about uh, equivalent to about four Earths. So, uh, big red spot, bigger than the planet Earth. And in conclusion, I would just like to say that uh, the information provided tonight has come from Astronomy 2020 by Wallace Dawes and Northfield. Uh, for those that are interested, the, this publication is published every year, and uh, I believe we go to try booking at the moment. You can order yourself your very own copy of Astronomy 2021. Thank you for listening, and Mark Stevens, until next month, we'll see you then. Hi everyone, this talk was put together to follow a main video about the end of the universe being pre-recorded. I don't actually know what will happen on the night, on how the universe might end. I think if you look up resources, including starting with good old Wikipedia, you see quite a good summary, then go on from there. So I think we'll just have fun here about creating a universe.
A quick recap. I previously presented on the topic orbits, how things are changeable cyclical events. So maybe the universe also. And I think that all things do not have to cycle through zero and a hundred percent. Things can oscillate between say 20% and 80%. Maybe the universe too. Another quick recap. I also raved about something fascinating. Fractals. How basic structures replicate to become big structures that retain features of the minute parts. One amazing seven-year-old watched my talk and gave me feedback, exclaiming, cauliflower. So talks here might suit bright, shiny, new astronomers. These fired up seven year old has been using binoculars, telescopes, spectroscopy gratings, and designing spaceships. Also dragged parents to watch Comet Lemon and the launch of the InSight Mars lander. So what about creating a universe like a creative project, exploring concept, choosing, designing. So what would you have? Perhaps design scope? What's your universe size? One example, although I dream big, beyond the universe of universes. I am also content with dreaming some earthly surrounding into a universe. <laughs> so how about a dream at all? There's a mindset that anyone can choose to have, such as how do I make it work? The all important thing here is astronomy. Astronomy will be exquisite from an atoll with all the usual necessities of life, especially the internet. Many things are quite straightforward and fun to do, like the long straight lines of Nazca, straight north-south line, therefore east-west, with just pieces of rope. A plum is easy, therefore vertical lines. Therefore, a small pyramid and the Inca technology. So I think really easy is at home and a five kilometer radius of 50 or 100 other situations come to mind. I have completely enjoyed 10-day meditation retreats where over nine days you have the peace of no conversation. Silence. How about a Mars habitat? Growing potatoes? Actually, I think sweet potatoes would be better.
This will make a grand universe here and now, virtual reality. Just one example of Google VR. Several years back, I had a taste of flying around the solar system with a prototype VR headset while in California. Then also in a bubble booth at Google Plex, flying any which way, like through the water under the Golden Gate Bridge. These things have advanced much further now with a cardboard viewer or VR headset. As classrooms use them, perhaps public and school astronomy virtual viewing might happen with us at some stage. The Google VR description mentions dinosaurs. So whenever our dinosaur and geology expedition happens, let's find out beforehand whether it is okay to bring a magnet for a sideline discovery in case you stumble on a potential meteorite. Sweet dreams now, creating a universe, virtual or a lived-in reality. What's that like? Bye. The Atacama Desert in northern Chile is famed for its dark night skies, which can be enjoyed in their full glory thanks to the absence of light pollution. But even the darkest sky is not completely dark. Astronomers at ESO's observatories often encounter a natural light phenomenon above ESO's telescopes, known as the zodiacal light. This is the ESOcast, cutting-edge science and life behind the scenes of ESO, the European Southern Observatory, exploring the ultimate frontier with our host, Dr. J, a.k.a. Dr. Joe Liske. Hello and welcome to another episode of the ESOcast. Now, ESO's observatories are such incredibly dark sites that normally the only thing that illuminates them on a moonless night is the faint light from the billions of stars in the Milky Way. But there are a number of other interesting phenomena that can be observed in the skies above the telescopes. These include, for example, the faint veil of air glow and the occasional appearance of red sprites above the odd distant thunderstorm. And then, every night, especially in the hours just after dusk or before dawn, this faint fuzzy column of light appears in the sky, just above the horizon extending upwards. This ghostly glow is known as zodiacal light. Shortly after sunset, just as stars begin to appear in the sky, the first hints of zodiacal light also become visible. As darkness sweeps over the desert, this light becomes more prominent and can be seen as a bright column of light reaching up from the horizon. This luminous column follows the starry background across the sky, eventually disappearing below the horizon as the Earth rotates on its axis. Even after the brightest part of the zodiacal light has dropped below the horizon, traces of it are still present, although it now resembles an extremely faint wispy bridge that brightens again in the early morning, just before daybreak. The origins of zodiacal light are to be found in the inner solar system, 
The sun is surrounded by tiny grains of ice and dust that are constantly being replenished by crumbling icy comets and colliding asteroids. These grains are distributed within the same flat disk of space inhabited by the planets. When viewed from Earth, this disk appears as a narrow path across the sky, called the ecliptic, which the Sun, Moon and planets all appear to follow as they move in the sky. Now zodiacal light is created when light coming from the Sun is scattered forwards off the particles in this disk in the direction of Earth. Now, when viewed from Earth, this creates the appearance of a continuous band of light along the ecliptic that gets fainter as you look further away from the Sun. Now, the constellations of the zodiac, of course, also lie along the ecliptic, and that's why we call this ghostly glow zodiacal light. Along the ecliptic, high in the sky, an oval patch of illumination can also appear, known as Gegenschein or counterglow. Named by the German explorer Alexander von Humboldt, this phenomenon is created by sunlight that is scattered backwards off interplanetary dust particles. It can be seen at the point in the sky opposite the sun. A similar phenomenon can be experienced here on Earth. When you turn your back to the sun in foggy weather, a halo of light called a glory sometimes appears around your shadow on the ground. The zodiacal light phenomenon seems to have been first investigated in the late 1600s by the Italian astronomer Giovanni Cassini and the Swiss mathematician Nicola Fatio de Duillet. Now they were absolutely fascinated with this light in the sky. And of course, back in the 17th century, there was very little light pollution. And so for them, it was relatively easy to observe this phenomenon, even from cities. Modern observations have shown that the solar system might not be the only one to exhibit zodiacal light. Data from the Very Large Telescope Interferometer at ESO's Paranal Observatory has revealed that numerous other planetary systems are also surrounded by interplanetary dust. Zodiacal light is a really photogenic feature, and so it's no surprise that it's become a popular subject for nighttime photographers in the Atacama Desert. The fact that it's so prominent at ESO's observatories is a beautiful demonstration of how incredibly good the observing conditions at these sites actually are. This is Dr. J, signing off for the ESOcast. Join me again next time for another cosmic adventure. George Gordon Byron was one of the most famous poets in history. Better known as Lord Byron, he was a leader in the Romanticism movement of the late 18th and early 19th century, famous for works like Don Juan and the poem She Walks in Beauty. But it is perhaps indicative of the Romanticist rejection of Western traditions like rationalism, moral absolutes, and agreed-upon social values that Lord Byron was as well known in his lifetime for his excesses as his poetry. Things like numerous love affairs with both men and women, many of whom were married, or running up huge gambling debts, or an obsession with drink and drugs. But it was this unruly streak that ironically had a surprising impact on the most rational of professions. Computer programming. It all has to do with a remarkable but underappreciated mathematician and involves some of the most famous people of the Victorian era. It is history that deserves to be remembered. George Gordon Byron was born in 1788. If he was going to grow up to be a psychopath, he came upon it honestly. His mother, Catherine Gordon, was given to bouts of melancholy and mood swings and was described as a woman without judgment or self-command. 
His father, an abusive profligate drunkard, was a British army officer who went by the name Mad Jack and who abandoned his wife and son after spending all her money, dying likely of an overdose of opium when Byron was just three years old. He inherited his title, Baron Byron of Rochdale, at the age of ten, upon the death of his great uncle, but the estate had little value. In 1811, he published the narrative poem, Child Harold's Pilgrimage, to wide acclaim that made him famous overnight. It was then, trying to escape from growing debts and rumors about his sexual escapades, that he married Annabel Milbank, a beautiful, remarkably intelligent and religious heiress, who apparently married Lord Byron in the hopes that she could set him on a straight moral path. In that she failed. Owing to his infidelity and erratic behavior, they separated just a month after the birth of their daughter, Lord Byron's only legitimate child, Augusta, affectionately called Ada. After their separation, Byron left England, never to return. Ada never met her father. They had no relationship. But he affected her in a unique way. Afraid that Ada would inherit her father's insanity, Lady Byron saw to it that Ada received tutoring in mathematics and music as disciplines to counter dangerous poetic tendencies, including tutoring by the famous mathematician Augustus de Morgan. In an era when women were certainly not widely encouraged to participate in intellectual pursuits, she became a mathematician. She married a baron in 1835, who was eventually made the Earl of Lovelace, making her the Countess of Lovelace. They had three children. High society in London in the 19th century was full of people pursuing science and mathematics. Included in her circle, Ada made friends and corresponded with some of the finest scientific minds of the era. Michael Faraday, Charles Wheatstone, Sir David Brewster, as well as author Charles Dickens. But the connection that would most impact her future was with mathematician and mechanical engineer Charles Babbage. Born in 1791, Charles Babbage was a gifted mathematician with a vision for applying mathematical principles to modern problems. He had his hands in many projects and ideas, from insurance actuarial tables to, notably, impacting industry through an analysis of division of labor. But Babbage's most famous contribution came from an interest in improving mathematical tables, critical for navigation, science, and engineering. Computed by hand, the tables were subject to error. Such math could be more accurately done, he argued, by a computational machine, which he called the difference engine, and which he later refined in a second model that he called the analytical engine. A difference engine is an automatic mechanical calculator used to tabulate polynomial functions. In short, it is a hand-cranked mechanical computer. Having met Babbage through a friend, Ava Lovelace became fascinated with his machine. Her largest contribution came in 1843. Babbage had given a lecture on his analytical engine in Turin, Italy. An Italian engineer had transcribed the lecture and published it in French. Realizing the lecture could help to spur interest in the project, Babbage's supporter, Charles Wheatstone, commissioned Ava to translate the article into English and to add notes. The notes ended up being longer than the paper and offered a clear understanding of the operation and potential of the machine. In the notes, she included a clear description of how Babbage's invention could be used to compute so-called Bernoulli numbers, a sequence of rational numbers which occur frequently in number theory. The implication was enormous. Her description is considered the first published algorithm ever specifically tailored for implementation on a computer. If Charles Babbage had invented the first mechanical computer, Ada Lovelace had written the first computer program. Perhaps even more importantly, she saw something that even Babbage did not. She realized that Babbage's machine could calculate beyond numbers and could theoretically solve problems of any complexity. For example, she theorized, if the fundamental relations of pitched sounds in the science of harmony and of musical composition were susceptible of such expression and adaptations, the engine might compose elaborate and scientific pieces of music of any degree of complexity or extent. Thus, she anticipated the implications of modern computing 100 years before they were realized. There is some controversy about whether she was actually the originator of the first computer program or whether she merely derived the idea from Babbage's previous work. But her supporters note that Babbage never produced anything as sophisticated or as clean as Ada's computation of the Bernoulli numbers. But the point is largely moot. Babbage's machine was never completed in his time and her program was never used. 
But those who studied the field of the history of the computer acknowledge that she seems to have been the first to conceive of the use of the computer beyond numerical calculations. Truly a visionary idea that earns her a unique and often forgotten place in history. Although she wrote her program long before anybody conceived of computer languages, when in the 1970s the United States Department of Defense decided to create a computer programming language to supersede the more than 450 computer programming languages that the DoD had been using, they named it after her. Called ADA, it is an international standard still in use today. Despite her mother's efforts to protect her from her father's insanity, she emulated him in some important ways. For example, like her father Lord Byron, she was addicted to gambling, and even wrote mathematical models that were supposed to help you be successful at gambling. They failed. Like her father, she died deeply in debt. At the age of 36, ironically the same age at which her father died, in November of 1852 of uterine cancer, Charles Dickens himself read to her from one of his novels, on her deathbed. To her mother's consternation, she was buried at her request next to her father in the family tomb in Nottinghamshire. Her prophetic predictions about the potential of personal computers were largely lost until they were found and republished in 1953, and it was there, on the verge of the personal computing revolution, that a voice from the past led us into a bold new future. All because her mother did not want her to be a poet, like her dad. But they both dealt in words that changed the world. As a stanza from his poem Don Juan says, Words are things, and a drop of ink, dropped like dew on a thought, produces that which makes thousands, perhaps millions, Hi, I'm Toby and welcome back to another video. Today I'd like to show you through some of the early works of Isaac Newton. These are very important contributions to science and mathematics made while Newton was quarantined at home during the Great Plague of London. This was a plague that went from 1665 to 1666. It was spread by fleas and killed around 100,000 people over the course of 18 months. Newton had been studying at Cambridge University and had just obtained his degree in 1665 when the university had to close as a precaution against the plague. So Newton returned home to Woolsthorpe Manor and over the next two years there developed his theories on calculus, optics and gravitation. It is at this home where the now famous apple tree is located. 1666 was Newton's year of wonders. He was aged 23 at the time and he later said that, In those days I was in the prime of my age for invention and minded mathematics and philosophy more than at any time since. In this video I would just like to focus on the work Newton did during this time on the topic of calculus and these pages are printouts from the Cambridge University Digital Library so the links for you to see the originals yourself will be in the description. This first document written by Newton and dated October 1666 has come to be called the 1666 Tract on Fluxions. It is the first collection of Newton's ideas on calculus. It is dated in a different ink, so this date could have been added later on, and there was quite a rivalry between Newton and Leibniz over who first described calculus, but regardless, this document is a collection of Newton's ideas since 1665, which can also be seen scattered through his earlier notebooks. It says to resolve problems by motion, these following propositions are sufficient. He then lays out a bunch of propositions and does some examples. To Newton, calculus was all about motion and he was trying to understand motion because the physics problems he was also working on required some kind of mathematical base, such as for gravitation. Neither Newton nor Leibniz were the first to completely come up with calculus. They were both building upon the work done by earlier mathematicians, such as Descartes. 
Let's work through this demonstration here ourselves to see what was going on. We're going to think about the motion of a moving particle. So at one moment in time, we could describe the position of the particle with an X and a Y. These coordinates Newton would later go on to call fluents as they are flowing quantities. And what we want to know is how we would describe this particle after a small period of time. So if it has moved to here, we would describe its x position as being x plus some new quantity, and likewise in the y direction. To find how much it has moved, we would find the velocity of the particle and multiply it by this small change in time. Newton refers to velocities in two directions as being p and q, and he uses o to denote a very small infinitesimal change in time. So in the x direction, we would write this as p times o. o is not equal to zero, but it is very small. So after this change in time, our x has gone to x plus p o, and our y has gone to y plus q o. Instead of using p and q, Newton would later go on to use x dot and y dot as the velocities, and he would call these the fluxions. But that would have to wait until a 1671 rewrite of this work. We can see it in Newton's notes here. He says, if the described lines be x and y in one moment, they will be x plus p o and y plus q o in the next. Newton then does a demonstration where the relation between lines x and y is x cubed minus a b x plus a cubed minus dy squared equals zero. He says, I may substitute x plus p o and y plus q o into the places of x and y. To expand something like this, he would have used the binomial expansion theorem, which he also had a hand in developing. I will denote these zeros here with a line through them to make sure that they aren't confused with these O's in here, which are not equal to zero. Newton then writes out the result of this expansion, and he says that since we know x cubed minus abx plus a cubed minus dy squared was zero, we can find those terms in our expansion and cancel them out. And then he writes the result of doing that. The next step is to divide every term by O, and we're able to do that since O is never actually equal to zero, and this is what we get. Newton then says, also those terms are infinitely little in which O is, therefore omitting them there rests, and he gives the solution. So if we cancel all of our terms with an O in it as being so small that they're not going to contribute, then we get the same solution that Newton gets, and it is our time derivative of what we started with. Remember that this is a derivative with respect to time, so it's like we had differentiated this implicitly. x cubed has become 3x squared times p, which is dx dt. That is exactly what you would get differentiating this and taking into account that x and y are functions of t. This technique was a little controversial because o is treated both as being not zero and close enough to zero to cancel out, and nowadays we use the notation of limits to make it more rigorous. We would say that in the limit of o going towards zero, this term would go towards zero. Now this whole demonstration here was actually a demonstration of Proposition 7, so why don't we have a look back at Proposition 7 to see what it was. Proposition 7 starts here and it talks about having an equation expressing the relation between two or more lines x, y, and z. 
and the relation of their velocities, p, q, and r, may be found by putting all the terms on one side of the equation so that they are equal to nothing, and first multiply each term by how many times p over x, as x have dimensions in the terms. And let's work through what he's doing here. We're going to start with the same equation that we had before, and we'll find its derivative this way, which is the same as saying the relation of the velocities. So we times each term by p over x for how many dimensions of x it has. So for example, this first term has three dimensions of x. So we will do x cubed times three times p over x. The second term has one dimension of x. The third and fourth terms have zero dimensions of x, so we would times it by zero times p over x, which is the same as multiplying it by zero, so I'm not going to write it down. He says that secondly, multiply each term by how many times q over y, as y has dimension in it. So we do the same thing now for y. The first three terms have zero dimension of y, so they would be multiplied by zero. But this last term has two dimensions of y, so you would times it by two times q over y. If you had a third variable, you would keep going. He says the sum of all of these products shall be equal to nothing, yep, so it's equal to zero, and the equation gives the relation of the velocities. So if we tidy this equation up, this x will cancel with one of the x's up there, and we will get 3x squared times p. These x's here will cancel, we'll get a, b, p. One of the y's will cancel, we'll get minus 2dyq equals to zero. And indeed, this is the time derivative of what we started with. And it was a quicker method than the one we just did before, but it's the same result. I find that really awesome that we're able to actually follow along with Newton as he's doing some derivatives. And we can see at the end here that he gives us a general form for doing this. Later in the document, he goes on to apply these theorems to resolving of problems. You can see here he's drawing tangents to crooked lines. And over here, problem five is to find the nature of the crooked line whose area is expressed by any given equation. That is, the nature of the area being given to find the nature of the crooked line whose area it is. And all this talk of area might remind you of integration, and Newton does go on to really talk about the link between differentiation and integration and finding the area beneath a curve. He seems aware that these two things are inverses, and that is the fundamental theorem of calculus. This is another document written by Newton, but at a later time, and I just wanted to show it to you because it shows that he does later go on to use the terminology fluxions, where instead of using p and q for the velocities, he uses x dot and y dot, but the rest of the examples here are the same. Fluxions were kind of central to the whole Leibniz-Newton controversy, and in fact, the last document I would like to show you is a letter in Latin that Newton wrote to Leibniz via another middleman called Henry Oldenburg. And this was dated the 24th of October, 1676. And in it, Newton explains fluxions, but actually conceals his words in code because he was so suspicious of Leibniz. Around here he says, I cannot proceed with the explanation of the fluxions now. I have preferred to conceal it thus. And then he puts this random string of numbers and letters, and it looks a bit like a Bitcoin address, but actually it's an enciphered phrase. And this phrase here defines the relationship between the fluent and fluxion. Now what he did to get this was he took the phrase in Latin saying, 
given an equation that consists of any number of flowing quantities to find the fluxions and vice versa. He then counted the frequency of each letter and ordered them alphabetically. If there were three or more of a letter, then he would put a number in front. So it looks like there were six A's and nine N's. Even if Leibniz could decode this, the phrase doesn't seem to show much, although it must have given Newton some kind of security over the idea. The fact he could put it down on paper and make a claim in this fight about his ideas being stolen. This issue of ownership became so complicated because Newton's work on fluxions and calculus and many other things wasn't published until a long time after he wrote it. Even Leibniz's work wasn't published straight away. And I thought this little document here would be a nice insight into the relationship between the two men. So that's been a look at some of Newton's original work. Even as a math student, I don't think I had really seen much of his original thinking. So I hope you found this video a little bit interesting. You can go to the links in the description to the Cambridge University Digital Library to see these documents. So for this video, I intentionally selected something surrounded by myths, dust. Unbelievable. So a while back when I was filming a different video, a PhD scientist told me, you know, 70% of household dust is dead skin. And I'd heard that before, and chances are you have too. If you type is dust into Google, the top autocomplete result is dead skin, because that's one of the most common ways people complete that query. But a quick scan of this page suggests that the claim is not true. It's a misconception. From live science, sometimes a specific percentage of dust is said to be dead skin, usually about 70 or 80%. But unless you're a molting bird or reptile, or you work in Dr. Frankenstein's laboratory, very little of your environment is composed of dead body parts. Or BBC Science Magazine, which asks, what is dust made of? Think it's human skin? Think again. The article says it's a misconception that it's mostly from outside, the rest is carpet fluff and clothes fibers. And sure enough, all over the web you'll find people debunking this idea. So is that it? Case closed? Hardly. I mean, I'm not just going to do one search and call it a day. It's important to be aware of your own biases. When I started this search, the claim seemed false. The idea that 70 to 80% of dust is dead skin. It's exactly the sort of thing that is gross enough to spread as an urban legend, but it just seems implausible. I mean, if most dust is dead skin, then why do abandoned buildings get dusty over time? The debunking claims fit my preconceptions, so it would be easy to stop here. But you gotta be careful not just to search to confirm what you already thought. A common mistake people make is putting the answer they are looking for right in the search query. Looking more closely, these websites lack scientific papers as references. And I'm curious, if the idea that 70 to 80% of dust is dead skin, if that's totally wrong, then how did the myth get started in the first place? Surely some dust must be dead skin, but how much? Well, a good strategy is to start broad. How do you define dust exactly? Well, dust is generally defined as particles that can become airborne for a significant period of time when perturbed by natural forces. But how long is a significant period of time? And what are natural forces exactly? So the definition of dust has fuzzy boundaries, kind of like dust itself. If you ask the question, how big is a dust particle? You get different answers. The International Standardization Organization defines dust as any particle smaller than 75 micrometers in diameter. That's roughly the width of a human hair. The glossary of atmospheric chemistry terms includes anything up to 100 micrometers, but I've found several papers that include particles as large as 2 millimeters. This large discrepancy is due to the fact that the most important property of a dust particle is not its size, but its settling velocity, which then determines how long it can stay airborne. A 100 micrometer metal ball would fall to the ground very quickly while a 2 millimeter long cotton fiber could float on indoor air currents indefinitely. So to get around the different sizes, shapes, and densities of dust particles, the International Standardization Organization has a way of calculating an effective diameter. 
They define it as the diameter of a hypothetical sphere of density one gram per centimeter cubed, having the same terminal settling velocity in calm air as the particle in question, regardless of its geometric size, shape, and true density. By any of these metrics, a single human skin cell with an average diameter of around 30 micrometers would count as dust. So then, how many dead skin cells are we shedding? You'd think the average rate of skin shedding would be well established, but the internet is a tangled web of misquotations and missing citations when it comes to skin. In trying to answer this question, I found dozens of web articles saying we shed anywhere between 30,000 skin cells per day to 300,000 skin cells per minute, and estimated weights of dead skin as high as 9 pounds a year per person. Using Google Scholar, a great resource for searching published scientific research, I was able to track down several peer-reviewed sources that agreed on the numbers. Every hour, you create about 20 million new skin cells. As those new skin cells form, they push older cells up through the layers of the epidermis. And over a period of weeks, they flatten out and harden, forming the barrier that protects our bodies from the outside world. Ultimately, these dead skin cells fall off, usually one by one, for healthy skin. So we are constantly molting, like a snake. We just don't notice it because our skin comes off one cell at a time. Fun fact, dead skin cells are shed more rapidly from your forearms than from your back, and more rapidly from your back than from your abdomen. And one of the ways scientists have measured these rates of skin shedding is actually by taping containers onto people's skin and collecting up the dead skin cells shed over at least a 48 hour period. Yeah, I'm gonna regret this. Based on these measurements, we know that each square centimeter of your body is shedding around a thousand dead skin cells per hour. Now the average adult body has a surface area of nearly two square meters, meaning you are shedding nearly 20 million dead skin cells per hour. That adds up to half a billion dead skin cells per day. Now, half a billion dead skin cells weigh between one and two grams. That's just a little bit less than the weight of a penny. Over a year, that means you shed half a kilogram or over a pound of dead skin. If you wanna think about it another way, in a single year, you give off around 180 billion dead skin cells. That's roughly the same number as there are stars in our Milky Way galaxy. An average family of 2.6 people could cover the entire horizontal surface of an average 2,000 square foot home with a layer of skin cells one cell deep in around 200 days. That is assuming all their dead skin cells accumulate around the house, which of course is not true. Some will come off in the shower and some will get captured in clothes and bed sheets and be rinsed out in the wash, not to mention dead skin cells shed outside the home. Still, the amount of skin we shed is not small. But how much is it as a percentage of household dust? Well, that turns out to be a trickier question because there are a lot of other sources of dust like pollen, fibers from rugs, clothes, and furniture, dirt from outside, even micrometeorites, dust from space. To clear things up, I called around to some dust experts, and they pointed me to this book, House Dust Biology by Johanna van Brunswick from 1981. And sure enough, on page 37, there is this graph. Now, it appears to show the fraction of skin particles in airborne dust as 80%, except not really. This is a stacked area graph, so Dead skin accounts for only 20% of dust particles between 100 and 300 micrometers. Could a simple misunderstanding of this graph be the source of the urban legend? I mean, it's possible. But what's more interesting to me is that the legend is not that far off. According to this, a full 50% of dust particles under 100 micrometers is dead human skin. The book also reports on a study where they vacuumed a mattress and studied the resulting dust ball under the microscope. 53% of the dust was skin particles. So the debunkers are debunked. While not 70 to 80%, dead skin cells do make up a significant portion of household dust. Of course, the exact percentage depends a lot on how much other dust is contributed by the environment. 
These studies were conducted in houses in the Netherlands, which typically have hardwood floors and therefore less dust than homes with carpeting. It also depends on how large of a particle you consider dust. Dead skin cells account for roughly half of the small dust particles, but much less than half of what is sucked up by your vacuum cleaner. Ugh, oh, that is gross. Unbelievable. I guess it makes sense that the place where we find the most dead skin cells is in and around our beds, where we spend a third of our lives shedding a third of our skin in our sleep. So then is it true that your mattress actually doubles in weight every 10 years? This claim was actually published in a major news outlet 20 years ago, with the increase in mass attributed to dust mites that feed on your dead skin. The claim, which lacked a scientific reference, is so disgusting it has spread throughout the internet. But it's not true. If two people slept on the same bed for a decade, and even if all their dead skin cells ended up in the mattress, it would only gain around 3 kilograms, or 7 pounds. And by conservation of mass, the dust mites that feed off that dead skin could not weigh more than that. So the total weight gain would have to be less than 10% the weight of an average mattress. And remember, dead skin cells are small and light enough to become airborne. Just making the bed has been found to increase the number of skin flakes in a cubic meter of air from 21,000 to 107,000. Skin scale dust is inevitable, and it occurs in higher quantities where there are more people. Scientists have studied the airborne dust in the London Underground and found that fragments of dead skin cells make up around 10% of all small dust particles by weight. And it's not just skin we are shedding. A ton of tiny organisms live on our bodies, a teeming microbiome of bacteria, fungi, and mites. Every hour, we shed approximately one million microbes in a cloud that spreads out a radius of about one meter from our bodies. In one study, an individual was placed in a clean room for 90 minutes. Scientists then identified who had been in the room not using their DNA, but rather using the characteristic fingerprint of their microbial cloud. The technique was so accurate, the team wrote that it clearly suggests a forensic application for indoor bioaerosols, meaning that one day we will likely use microbial dust clouds to solve crimes. Dust can reveal a lot about us because a significant fraction of it literally is us. I mean, everyone has heard the expression dust to dust, but they're probably not thinking about how each and every day part of us is becoming dust. You know, when I was reading this uh, house dust biology book, I found some sections that sounded to me a little bit like poetry. So studying uh, dust from an office under a light microscope revealed tree fibers from paper, eraser dust, rubber, calcite, and pumice, human hair, various dyed wools, cottons, and synthetic fibers such as nylon, rayon, cellulose, triacetate, and orlon, dander, tobacco, cigarette ashes, graphite, wood shavings, oil soot, paint chips, glue, fingernail filings, and traces of quartz and starch. I love all these words because they bring vivid images to mind. It's like the tiniest fragments of our lives can paint a full picture of reality of who was there and what they did. You know, searching through dust is a little like searching the internet. There are so many pieces, it's fuzzy, nebulous, but with the right tools and a bit of perseverance, I'm confident that we can uncover the truth buried in there. In this case, the truth is that dust, particularly these small particles and dust around beds, is mostly dead skin. Why does that matter? Because it is something we can be certain about. I mean, for centuries, science has beaten back the shrouds of ignorance. And knowing what is really true is the only way we have been able to make progress. The internet gives us a great opportunity to share that knowledge. But only if someone takes the time to research and establish what really is true.